Good morning, members, uh, and welcome to our full council meeting of the 26th of March. Good morning. I'm Councillor Barry Stone, Chairman of Norfolk County Council, and I would like to welcome you all to this council meeting and quickly go over some general housekeeping. This meeting is being held in person at County Hall and is also being streamed live on the County Council's YouTube channel. The recording will also be available to view afterwards. A fire alarm test is not expected during the meeting. If the alarm sounds, we must evacuate County Hall. In the event of emergency, please make your way to the nearest exit and meet at the muster point located in the main car park. When using your microphones, please make sure it's switched on when you speak and uh, towards it. And this can tell the cameras to focus on you and ensure that you can be heard on the live stream. When you are finished speaking, please push the button to turn off your microphone, as this will allow the system to pick up the next speaker. Uh, if you need to leave the meeting early, could you please also remove your card and leave it on the desk so that the AV system can see that you are no longer in, in the meeting. It would be very helpful if councillors, if councillors, you could indicate clearly if you wish to speak by raising your hand high. Please switch off your microphone when you have finished. Alex, are we ready to go live? Thank you very much. For those who may have just joined us, I'm Councillor Barry Stone, Chairman of Norfolk County Council. Welcome to this meeting of Norfolk County Council today on the 26th of March 2024. We start our meeting, as always, with prayers, and I would like to welcome our chaplain for today, the Reverend Albert Cadmore, to our meeting and ask him to begin today's proceedings by calling upon him for prayers. Well, first of all, let's hold in mind all those in the ongoing conflicts around the world, and especially this morning, those involved in the bridge disaster at Baltimore. So now let's pray for our meeting today. Almighty God, we come to you today asking for your guidance and inspiration as we gather for this council meeting. Help all to engage in meaningful discussion. Guide us in the ways of truth, tolerance, wisdom and integrity. And keep us ever mindful of the needs of the people and communities that we seek to serve. We pray in your name. Amen. Thank you for that, <clears throat> Reverend Cadmore. <clears throat> we now move to apologies. Apologies for the meetings. Lane, please. Thank you, Chair. We have apologies today from Councillor Paul Neal, Councillor William Nunn, Councillor Jim Moriarty, Councillor Will Richmond, Councillor Carl Anderson, Councillor Andrew Proctor, Councillor Ed Maxfield, Councillor Ian Mackey, Councillor Tony White, Councillor David Sayers, Councillor Richard Price, Councillor Nigel Dixon, Councillor Sharon Blundell, Councillor Steve Riley, Councillor Martin Storey, Councillor Graham Carpenter, Councillor Tim Adams, Councillor Judy Oliver, and Councillor Rodri Oliver. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now move to agenda item two, the minutes from the council. Um, of the 20th of February 2024. Councillor Bambridge. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it states uh, that I have a pecuniary interest in West Norfolk Carers. Uh, this is under uh, item four. Uh, I don't. It's non-pecuniary. Thank you very much. If we move to the Council minutes, purely for accuracy of the uh, 20, um, where are we? I'll find them in a minute, sorry. 20th of February. Yeah. 
page five, page six, page seven, page eight, page nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, Councillor Kemp. Oh, yes, Mr Chairman, yes. Um, it's page 15 and 16, my amendment about giving um, money to West Norfolk carers. I note that the, the leader said we're here to help, but the council still hasn't given any funding to save it. What can be done about this, please? Uh, can I just... The, these minutes are just for accuracy, Councillor Kemp, not for asking questions of the leader at this stage. Thank you. Council 16, Kep, page 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28. Okay, happy me to confirm those minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> we now move on to agenda item three to receive any announcements from the chair, leader, or chief executive. Uh, I'd like to start with some announcements from the chair. First of all, like the rest of the country, we were all shocked and saddened to hear the news of the Princess of Wales cancer diagnosis. And I'm sure all councillors will join me in sending our very warmest wishes to Her Royal Highness for a full recovery. I would like to inform members um, that the events I have attended can be found on the chairman's page of the Norfolk County Council website. And I continue to uh, attend many very varied and exciting and interesting uh, meetings and I've met so many different people, which is marvelous. One highlight I might mention is the, the 200th anniversary of the RNLI, which we had a service in the cathedral last weekend, which was uh, very well attended and was very moving and very poignant. I would like now to, um, it is, it's now my great pleasure to thank Air Commodore Kevin Pellet for being the Armed Forces Commissioner for Norfolk for the full term of five years. He has steered the Covenant Board through the, through the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, the sad passing of Her Majesty the, the, uh, the Queen and the coronation of His Majesty King Charles. I know the Board is grateful for his leadership and advice. Kevin is widely respected by, by both the civic and the Armed Forces communities for his strong advocacy and support. He oversaw the development of Norfolk's first needs assessment for the armed forces community. He took particular interest in encouraging GP surgeries to obtain veteran friendly accreditation and in the publication of a service pupil premium booklet to guide teachers and military families in how best to support service children who move to schools, who move schools quite frequently. So the council wishes Kevin well for the future. Andrew Taylor, Warrants Officer Class 1, starts as the next Armed Forces Commissioner on the 1st of April, and the council looks forward to working with him. I now ask the, the leader for any comments that she has. Thank you, Chairman. I need to update you all on some significant news about the Norwich Western Link. As you know, the government has approved the outline business plan for this much needed project. We know that many Norfolk residents want to see the Western Link delivered as soon as possible to ease congestion and rat running, to improve safety, to speed up journeys and to boost our economy. And on that basis, we are about to submit our planning application. We were confident that we could comply with all requirements and follow Natural England's advice concerning the measures we would have to take around Barberstell Bats. Our officers have been in dialogue with Natural England for over a year, seeking their input, 
and were confident we would secure the relevant licence in order to commence construction. We were awaiting the latest comments from Natural England by the 29th of February, but they contacted us to say that due to a lack of resources, they could not respond before the 15th of March. Fair enough, you might say, except that on the 8th of March, Natural England issued new guidance notes, moving the goalpost to such an extent that they will make it almost impossible for us to be granted a licence. Call me cynical if you will, but the timing of this stinks. Our officers have checked and double-checked the guidance and we've taken legal advice on our position. The truth is that without that licence, we cannot build the road. The Cabinet was briefed yesterday and we've informed our MPs. I myself have spoken with Steve Barclay, the Secretary of State for DEFRA's Chief of Staff, who incidentally knew nothing about this. I've asked them to urgently look into this. Unfortunately, I fear this is yet another example of an unelected quango introducing new rules to suit their narrow remit without thought about how this affects everyone else. We saw this on nutrient neutrality, which was a disaster for the house building industry. And now we see this new advice, and I use that term loosely, which threatens to block any infrastructure scheme in the whole of southern and central England and Wales. If you think I'm joking, take a look at the map they produced in their report. The yellow area is the area where they think there may be Barbastel bats and where they would block licences for construction. The very first line of the report says, this definition, which is the definition that Barbastel bats do not have favourable conservation status, i.e. they're not increasing in number and distribution, draws heavily on modelling and an unpublished report. Later on, the report says their conclusions are based solely on the information within their document, and this is not a formal assessment of status or a comprehensive monitoring of status, i.e. it's a guesstimate. So we have an unpublished report, an, an admission that they actually know very little about these bats or the size of their population, or how numbers have changed over time, Yet they've modelled their results on this and made a virtual declaration that massive swathes of England and Wales are unsuitable for infrastructure projects due to the possible maybe presence of these bats and the maybe, maybe not issue that a new road might or might not have an adverse impact on the population numbers, even though they do know, not know what they are or whether they're in increase or decline. Yet they make a determination that existing and potential roost sites should be protected from disturbance and development. This report is not worth the paper it's written on, and yet I'm certain it will be used as an excuse to refuse us a license to build the Norwich Western Link. Barbastel bats are predominantly from Central and Southern Europe. They are widely distributed from Morocco to Sweden. Natural England, by their own admission, do not have enough data to confirm or deny their suppositions on the populations in the UK, yet they have made their decision. It begs belief that vital infrastructure projects, which have the backing and funding from central government and the overwhelming support of the local population, can be blocked on the hoof, without evidence, and effectively in secret by such an unelected organisation. The Cabinet and I have met and we are agreed. We will not sit by and let this project be derailed without a fight. We will be submitting our planning application and we will be challenging this attempt to subvert the will of the people and their elected representatives by every means at our disposal. And we urge those of you who agree with us to support us. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, I have nothing from the Chief Executive. We now move on to... Where are we? Thank you. We now move on to uh, agenda item four, members to declare any interests. Do councillors have any interests that they wish to declare? Councillor Ward. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> yes, I'm director and chairman of the Norfolk Museums Development Foundation. Thank you. Okay, I can't see anybody else. Um, petition tip. Agenda item five, petitions presented to the council. No 
No positions, petitions have been presented. Agenda item six, business remaining from the last council meeting. We have no outstanding business items. Agenda item seven, questions to the leader. We now have 15 minutes for questions to the leader. And we start with the uh, Lib Liberal Democrat group, please. And Councillor Watkins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Can the leader help settle the minds of those who will be affected by the proposal to reduce the minimum income guarantee and to validate the seriousness of this consultation by outlining what threshold must be met for this administration to remove the proposal from its budget plans. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, I think we've had this question in this chamber before, and we are still in the throes of our consultation. And this is not a question that I can answer at this time because I do not want to prejudice the outcome of that consultation. So I'm afraid I can't give you any further information at this time. Thank you very much. Um, now we move on to the Labour group. Councillor Sands. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, question for the leader. Is the leader still pressing for the undergrounding of sea or sea laying of cables due to pass across our county, either with this government or the next? And is the leader aware that DC transmission rather than AC transmission means that lighter gauge and therefore cheaper cables can be used due to only 3% as opposed to 30% energy loss over a given distance? And this with appropriate AC-DC converters used at each end. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I did recently go to a meeting on this very subject, and um, I think that one of the big issues we face is that the technology that we would really like to have so that we could lay these cables underground more easily doesn't exist. I know there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of uh, research going on in China and places like that to try and get new cables which take uh, a much bigger power load, but it's not something that's actually available to the market at the moment. Um, I was very disappointed that it looks like if we were to have a Labour government that Rachel Reeves would impose pylons on Norfolk regardless of what local people feel. And I know there is strong opposition to having pylons north to south across our county when we don't even get any of the power that goes through them. A longer term solution needs to be found and that should be ideally offshoring which would give us the network that we need for the future. But if that can't happen, then we certainly should look at undergrounding those cables. It's not fair on the people who live in the beautiful south of Norfolk to have more pylons on top of the ones they already have to suffer. And I will be pressing any future government to be bringing power to us, not through us. Thank you very much. Um, I now move to the, the Green Group. Councillor Osborne. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you for your update on the Norwich Western Link, uh, Councillor Mason Billig. In the 4th of December Cabinet report on the Norwich Western Link, it said that if the project didn't go ahead, then the Council would have to use a combination of reserves, looking at other um, service areas to find cuts to fund the, uh, the £40 million that has already been sunk into the project. Can you confirm? What work is being done now to look at where that £40 million is going to come from to cover the costs that you've already incurred on the project that seems now not to be going ahead? Thank you, Councillor. Um, fortunately, we have been repaid quite a lot of the money that we've already spent. Um, the first tranches of those money have come through, and if uh, this project is stopped through to a government intervention, then the precedent is that we wouldn't have to repay any monies. And we would certainly be pressing for them to reimburse us all of our costs, because I think that's only fair if, if that's the outcome. However, it's very early days. We've only just found out about this new report, and so we are looking into all the possibilities. Um, ultimately, if we have to pay that money back, then it's in the hands of the government who've done this to us. Uh, and I can't get around that. There's no way I can get around that. But uh, we will do everything we can to make sure this council doesn't suffer. And first and foremost, we will make sure that we press to get that project underway and get that Western Link built, because that's what the people of Norfolk deserve and it's what they want. 
Thank you very much. Um, I now move to the non-aligned member, Councillor Webb. Thank you, Chair. I actually had a point of order. That was why I had my hand up, hand up earlier, sorry. Um, but I have a question as well. So perhaps, can I do both? Is that? You can. Thank you. Um, so point of order is, um, I'd like to invite the Chair to provide a personal explanation as to why after the papers were published for today's meeting, um, he's changed the um, organization of questions so that uh, non-aligned members are only allowed to ask one question during leaders and cabinet questions and thus treating myself and Councillor Corlett less favorably than Councillor Kemp has been treated in her time as an online member and why that's happened, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that is, it is, I'm afraid I'm going to rule that as irrelevant because it's not point of order. There is nothing in the constitution which prevents that happening and an explanation has been sent, I think, uh, to the relevant councillors from the um, um, monitoring officer. And to deal with it. So it's not, it is not a point of order. There is nothing, there's no point in the constitution that you can refer it to. So you're, you're wrong there. That there will be no further discussion on that. It's been dealt with. So if you would like to move to your question under, under questions to the leader, then please do. Thank you, Chair. Uh, residents in Town Close and Councillor Corlett have for several months been raising with highways serious safety concerns about um, pedestrians on St Stephen's Street. Um, sadly, last week a young person was hit by a bus resulting in the air ambulance needing to land on the playing field at Bignold School. Uh, will devolution bring additional funding for the safety measures to address the failure of the transforming city scheme to transform safety in the area? And that's a question on behalf of... Um, Councillor Corlett, who's um, won the lottery and has got an emergency dental appointment today. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I was unaware of, of that pedestrian being injured on St Stephen's. I'm very sorry about that. Um, um, if highways have been alerted, then I'm sure that they'll be looking into it. In terms of devolution, there is a, a, an option for us to look at new infrastructure under devolution. There will be money available. The decisions on how that money is spent will be taken by various boards, an investment board and a, a leaders board, which will be made up of um, the district councils, the city council, mm -hmm. county council um, and various other interested parties. So bids can be put into that. So I would suggest that um, you could ask your, your city council leader to perhaps bring that up at that meeting, that that could be one of the first things that we look at in terms of where we spend the devolution money on infrastructure. We will get the first £10 million as soon as we make the decision to change our governance. And that decision is yet to be made. That will be made on the 23rd of July if we do it. But after that, the money will come in and we can start looking at um, new projects. Thank you very much. Um, now move to the Conservative group. Councillor Clancy. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> in view of the leader's statement this morning concerning the Norwich Western Link, the devastating news of the report published by the um, unelected, unaccountable Quango that is Natural England, um, and the impact that this will have um, potentially on the economy, the environment, and, or, and the whole way of life for the Western Fringe parishes, and of course Norfolk as a whole, could the leader outline what she's proposing to do uh, in the short term to actually try to um, improve this situation and get this absolutely vital project for Norfolk back on track? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Um, as I have already said, I've already spoken to several of our MPs who are absolutely appalled by this, this latest uh, report that's come out. Um, and I've also been in contact with the Secretary of State's Chief of Staff, and he is now looking into that. And we're going to make sure that all the ministers are aware of this, this new move, which appears to be a, an attempt to block all infrastructure in the south of England and Wales. Um, on top of that, last night I saw Lord Fuller, who, as you know, has just been elevated to the House of Lords, the previous leader of South Norfolk Council, 
and he has been speaking to Lord Banner KC, who is looking into matters of infrastructure being blocked by legal challenges um, for, uh, against the, uh, the wishes of residents and wasting taxpayers' money. So there is already some movement underway to look into matters where infrastructure, major infrastructure is blocked. And he's very interested in this, incredibly interested in this. And I have got his personal number and I will be contacting him to add this to the list to see what he can do to see if we can't stop this nonsense from happening. There has to be common sense and there has to be a balance between environment and people. We need to have progress. We need safety. We need infrastructure we need so that people can just go about their daily lives. And we desperately need economic development in Norfolk. The decisions that have been made are not based on facts or evidence. They're based on ideology. And Natural England needs to be reined in. It needs to serve the purpose it was set up for. And currently, it's not doing that. So I will do my best to fight this fight. And I know that you're all behind me. And I thank you for that. Thank you very much. And now move on to round two and start with the Liberal Democrat group. Councillor Roper, I believe. So it's Councillor Penfold. It's me, if that's all right, um, Mr Chairman. Um, the Disability Network Norfolk Group has raised worrying concerns surrounding the approach of the MIG consultation. Concerns include consultation invitations not being received by caregivers, accessibility issues for the visually impaired, and drop-in sessions not being attended by social care staff. That's to name but a few. At a time of great distress for those in receipt of MIG, why has this consultation process so far been so shambolic? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Well, I can't agree it's been shambolic. I know there was a, an error with sending out invitations at one point, but that was quickly overcome. The consultation is a 12-week long consultation, and having spoken to Debbie Bartlett, she is... Um, she is sure that there is enough time to make sure that all of the users and all the people who are involved in this consultation can be properly spoken to and can have their point of view put across. And I don't know that we're going to actually be able to know everything until the end of the consultation about how it's gone. But I, I take your point on, on board. There was, um, there was an issue with letters going out, but it was, it was noticed quite quickly and it was addressed. And I don't feel that that will disadvantage anyone. Thank you very much. Now move on to the Labour group. Thank you. Uh, the recent Conservative budget failed to mention the word Norfolk once. Not one mention of support for those affected by flooding or coastal erosion. 14 years of Conservative failure and there is still nothing for our county. Is the leader not disappointed? I don't th think you could always expect to have Norfolk um, mentioned in every single um, speech by the Chancellor of the Exchequer and what you need to look at is the the small print of what comes out afterwards um, we know that there is money coming to Norfolk there's certainly money coming to Norfolk under devolution and money coming to Norfolk under many other guises um, there isn't there isn't money for absolutely everything we'd want to do we have to accept that we are still in a cost of living crisis and all of us have to have to cut our cloth accordingly but you can be assured, councillor, that when it comes to Norfolk, I will always be championing our cause and I will always be asking for more money. And I have, in fact, had um, a letter back on the flooding issue and the money that will come to Norfolk on that basis, which I will share with you all. Thank you very much. Um, now move to the Green Group. Thank you. Given the commendable climate strategy and net zero ambitions to which this council is committed, it seems vital that we should take the people of Norfolk with us on a journey to a cleaner, happier zero carbon future. Most people are more than happy to pursue such a future that benefits people and planet, even if it's costly. Yet the Conservative government in Westminster is sabotaging this ambition by imposing a planning regime for national strategic infrastructure projects that encourages and legitimises the rape of our natural environment without consent and deliberately silences the voices of both experts and local residents. Despite what the leader says about natural England, most people in this county are keen to preserve nature and to listen to the experts when they speak. 
The proposed Norwich to Tilbury power line is a clear example of this kind of injustice. What does the leader of this council plan to do to ensure that a future government will restore the rights of the people of Norfolk to speak on what affects them, to insist that people's voices should be heard and respected, especially when they suggest better ways to deliver the strategic improvements we need? Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. I think I would have... Um slightly more respect for experts if they actually based their findings on some facts and didn't just make guesses about what they think or may not think is actually happening in, a, in, a, in terms of the green environment. Uh, no, I'm sorry, but I'm speaking. We have a very good climate strategy in this council. We have an extremely good record in, in our environmental uh, policies, as she well knows, and we will continue to pursue those we live in a very beautiful rural county and we intend to preserve that and look after it. But we cannot stop progress and we cannot ignore the will of the people and we cannot stop economic development coming to this county. So we need a common sense approach and that's exactly what you get from this Conservative administration. Thank you very much and that's time up on the uh, questions to the leader. So we now move on to... a. Item 8, which is the recommendations from Cabinet meeting held on the 4th of March 2024. And I invite the Leader to move the recommendations in the Cabinet report. Thank you, Chairman. I mean, the Cabinet report was mainly on the finances, and so I would like to hand over, over to my Deputy Leader, who is um, in charge of finance, who will outline some of the main points. Thank you, Leader. Yes, uh, the, uh, the finance monitoring report covered uh, period eight, that's November uh, 2023, um, and uh, the, uh, the, capital, um, um, uh, the capital spend, most of it externally received, uh, was, uh, is, is listed there. I say that externally received because it underlines the point that we are in Norfolk County Council extremely effective in bringing in external capital uh, to this county. Uh, 49 million, uh, for example, in, uh, in BSIP money, and on the assumption that it is not upended uh, by this ludicrous new report, um, a significant funds up to 251 million pounds for the Norwich Western Link. Uh, the, uh, the finance monitoring report uh, demonstrates that the, uh, that the revenue budget was in balance uh, in November. Of course, it remains in balance, uh, and, uh, and I'm confident that that will be the case uh, as we now reach the end of, of the financial year. However, uh, it is, uh, of course, um, um, to be noted that there were significant overspends within uh, children's services and um, adult services during the year, and uh, that the reserves that were used uh, in, order to, um, in order to resolve that uh, are not um, available to those departments. The departmental reserves are not available to them in future years. I have no other comments to make. Thank you very much. I move the report, Chairman. Thank you. Okay. All, all those in favour of approving that report, please show. Against? Thank you very much. That's passed. Then we. Oh, sorry, any abstention? My apologies. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks very much. <coughs> <coughs> Item 9 Cabinet reports and questions to Cabinet members. We turn to the reports from the Cabinet and questions to Cabinet members now. And I call upon the Leader to move the Cabinet report for the meetings held on the 29th of January and the 4th of March, 2024. I so move, Chairman. So moved, thank you very much. Seconder? No need for a seconder. No need for, sorry, no need for a seconder. All in favour? Thank you. Against? Abstentions? Thank you very much. So we now move to uh, the 30 minutes for questions for cabinet members. And I start with the Liberal Democrat group. Thank you very much. Can thank you, cross? Chair. Sorry, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> My question covers a number of areas, so I'll direct it to the leader. 
Delivering a better future for Norfolk was the strap line of this administration's 2021 manifesto. And yet we have the worst malnutrition rates in the country, the third worst performing area for GP waiting times in the country, the third worst underspend in dental service in the country, the worst rates of children in need in East Anglia, record levels of fuel poverty, more than 2,000 residents waiting vital social care, some of the worst rates for fibre optic coverage in this country. When exactly will this better future be delivered? Thank you, Councillor, for the past political broadcast. Uh, you may have to wait until you see our manifesto where we will outline how we have met the, these challenges and all the things that we promised and how we have actually done them and exceeded them in most cases. This, this Conservative administration has done a fabulous job over the last four years. I was very, very um, delighted to be able to become leader here and to follow on from Andrew Proctor's excellent work, which he did in the first half of our term. And you will find out when we get to our manifesto just exactly how we have met those requirements and we will be putting that to the people of Norfolk and we will be asking them to give us another term in office. And I'm sure you'll look forward to that. Can the cab it's okay. Can the Cabinet Member for Children's Services please update us on whether the former Angel Road Junior School building has been handed back to the Council and the timetable for a sufficiency appraisal so it can be turned into a much needed SEND school? Does the Cabinet Member have any news about the impact on the condition of the building as a result of recent heavy rain given the condition of the roof? I've had lots of residents who have been of concern about the guttering being full of weeds and all of the area and building being really neglected. Uh, thank you. Um, I think that's the sixth time this question has been asked. I will answer it. As far as I'm aware, the lease has not been handed back yet. And until such times that's handed back into our possession, I really can't comment. Thank you. Thank you. Question for Councillor Jameson. Uh, um, obviously, we've just heard Councillor Mason Billig saying that um, we'll take the issue of the Norwich Western Link to the courts. Um, I think uh, it would be worth noting some of the attacks that have been laid against count, um, a former councillor, Dr Andrew Boswell, for doing exactly that um, and the costs that have been incurred as a result of those legal actions. But my question to Councillor Jameson is, how, you mentioned that the obviously the the cost of the Western Link in your financial update just now. What's going to be the cost of going to court and how's that going to be built into the, the risk contingency? Um, thank you, Councillor. I, I um, did not hear the leader say that we would be taking Natural England to court. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's highly unlikely that that would be the route we would take. Um, it's a national issue, not a local issue. Uh, and uh, there are a great many uh, um, ways in which we will challenge this uh, ludicrous um, guidance note um, other than court. So just a point of clarification, because I think this is important for, for all members. How will you be challenging Natural England, if not through the courts? We, I think that uh, the leader has already given a list of, of what she's already done through, uh, through the Secretary of State, um, and, uh, and that will be how we will, will deal with it. Uh, we believe that, uh, that this is a, a question or a solution to be found within government, not within the courts. I fear this is not something uh, which our good friends in the legal system will earn money from. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I now move on to the non-aligned members. Councillor Kemp. Thank you, Mr Chairman. My question is directed to the leader as the um, Cabinet Member for Strategy and Governance. For ten years ago, there was a huge democratic deficit in this chamber when the Conservatives wanted to impose an incinerator in South Lynn. But we see evidence of a democratic deficit arising again. For example, in the summer, Project Gigabit by the County Council didn't include West Norfolk and the business plans of Independence Matters, which are in the, committee pa the Cabinet Papers, 
show that there is no, um, the focus is on East and um, Norwich. And this is why West Norfolk has been left out for funding for West Norfolk carers. We also have the issue of the, um, the incinerator being planned for the West Norfolk border. How does the, the leader in her role as leader for the whole of Norfolk propose to address the growing democratic deficit against West Norfolk in this council, please? Well, I'm sorry, Councillor, but I don't agree that we don't look after West Norfolk. We do look after West Norfolk. I have regular meetings with the leader of West Norfolk Council, and uh, we spend an awful lot of money in West Norfolk. It's funny, isn't it? It doesn't matter which district I go into. They say, well, you never spend any money in my district. I get the same from Great Yarmouth. I get the same from Breckland. I get the same from North Norfolk. It's very easy to just focus on your own area, but actually if you look at the spend that we have across Norfolk, we try to be as fair as possible. And certainly with devolution, all of those district leaders will sit at the table and they will help to decide where we spend that money. And I can assure you it will be distributed fairly and West Norfolk will get its fair share. Thank you very much. Conservative group, please. Thank you. Councillor Hemsell. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I have a question for Councillor Jameson. Um, I was delighted to see in the press that uh, Norfolk County Council was part of the class action against Apple Inc. Um, so I just wondered if we could have a bit more illustrative information to the background of this success story for Norfolk. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed, Councillor. Well, um, this was a uh, 490 million US dollar uh, recovery. It's a historic result uh, for a UK uh, fund uh, leading shareholder litigation in the US. Um, and I believe it reflects the perseverance and the tenacity uh, of the Norfolk Pension Fund, which was appointed by the court uh, to lead this case. It's an indication of the strength of governance uh, of the uh, Norfolk Pension Fund that uh, it was chosen as the, uh, as, as the uh, lead plaintiff in this case. And you know, this was no empty threat by Norfolk. Uh, the, uh, uh, the trial uh, uh, was, uh, was, uh, was, had in fact seen a, a precedent just before the Apple case began. Uh, Norfolk Pension Fund was lead plaintiff again, um, and uh, that was in another securities fraud action in California. Uh, it was presented to a federal jury in a, a, jury in a two week trial, and uh, that um, uh, Norfolk won a unanimous verdict amounting to a further uh, 54 million pounds. Uh, Norfolk appears to be the first uh, UK pension fund ever to take a US securities class action to trial, let alone win it. Uh, and uh, it now has presided over this largest securities fraud class action settlement ever achieved by any UK fund, and I'm extremely proud of that. Thank you very much. Uh, right, we're now going to uh, round two and Liberal Democrats, please. Thank you uh, to Councillor Plant. Uh, Norfolk's roads surfaces are amongst the worst in the country, with the repair backlog bill increasing to £69 million last year. This council has also the unfortunate accolade of being one of the authorities paying the most in compensation to drivers. When will the Cabinet member finally concede that this whack-a-mole approach to road repairs is not working and a more sustainable transport model is necessary for Norfolk? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Akiron. And... I have to totally disagree with that last comment of yours, or in fact, all of it. We, ha we have some of the best roads in the country, and in the local area, Suffolk, Cambridge, Lincolnshire, we are absolutely uh, the best in this area as far as road repairs is concerned. And the figures and the statistics do point that out. I think it's very sad that you are picking on a, 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 a road system in Norfolk, 6,000 miles, which has a really good record of dealing with potholes. If you report a pothole in the correct way, not on Facebook, not on social media, but the proper way through the council website, it will be dealt with within three days. 
if it meets that requirement, if it's deep enough to be dealt with in that particular time. If it isn't, it might be dealt with within a six-week period. But it is dealt with if it's reported in the right way. I think it's really disappointing from the councillor for North Norfolk that he, he describes it in such a way that um, we should be ashamed of ourselves. We just had £4 million extra from government for potholes. We have £110 million over the next 10 years to deal with potholes and, and the road system in, in Norfolk. And yes, we are behind with it, but not as behind as our, our, our neighbours. We come second out of 48 councils uh, in making sure that our roads are properly serviced and maintained. And that is on record. That is a fact. Not the drivel that you've just come out with. This is a fact. And I, 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 I'm really disappointed because I think it's unfair to the people of Norfolk to describe the roads as such when they are actually some of the best in the country. Chairman, point of order by way of personal clarification. There's no point of order. I'm sorry, you're not the chair, Councillor Plant. Um, quite notwithstanding any possible breach of the member's code uh, coming from the language Councillor Plant has used, I would like to suggest that he may have misunderstood my question. Thank you. I, th I would request in fact, that we, we refrain from insults to whoever it might be. Thank you, Chairman. I, I, if I've insulted him, I, I really apologise for that. Um, but, the fact, but the fact that he made a mistake in what he said in the first place was uh, quite annoying, to That's be honest. That's fine. With we'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Now move to the Labour group. Uh, thank you um, for that. Um, my question is to Alison Thomas, and it's about the minimum income guarantee consultation. And may I say, um, before you maybe remind me that people are aware that this is a consultation and not a referendum, I fail to understand why this flawed and unfair consultation has gone ahead. Has the council learnt nothing from the last minimum income guarantee fiasco, which cost the county council both financially and reputationally? The council has admitted mistakes were made with the consultation and that letters were sent to individuals and not to the nominated individuals uh, that they should have gone to. This has led to confusion and anxiety. My understanding is many people with visual impairment were not sent appropriate documentation and many people didn't receive the easy read version. There have been no drop-in sessions arranged in Holt, Fakenham, Aylsham or Cromer so a large part of North Norfolk's been left out. I understand that new consultations were added, but I'm not confident that everybody's been made aware of them. There is a drop-in session in DIS on the closing date of the 17th of May, but that really doesn't give people long enough uh, to, uh, to decide what they want to say. The leader earlier spoke about evidence and she says she's confident about the consultation process. But what evidence is this based on? Vulnerable people who should receive the very best are being let down again uh, by this council. So many people, and I do get emails on this, are afraid and worried about this whole consultation because of what it means to them. More time should have been given, given the errors, and, and I'm... I'm shocked and I echo the concerns of the Liberal Democrat group that they've brought this morning and I think the attitude of the council is arrogant and dreadful. Thank you. I might just add, please, or mention that statements do not achieve anything when it's questions to a cabinet member. Get on with the questions and we might get through a few more. Thank you. Um, I, yes, I am a little uncertain what the precise question was, but clearly the decision was taken at the budget meeting um, that further savings needed to be made in adult social care, most particularly, um, partly by the fact that there's a, a, there was a large overspend in this current year and therefore some of the savings that we had factored in for next year needed to come back into this year to um, end up in a balanced position, which I'm sure Councillor Jameson could allude to. It is absolutely right that when we make a decision to make a saving within the budget, that we consult the people that are impacted. Um, it has already been explained by the leader that there was an error 
in sending, and I don't apologise for sending the, the documents to the people impacted, but I do apologise for the fact that we didn't also send them to the people who were um, acting as their advocates. Um, that has been addressed, and as far as I'm concerned, this process needs to continue, and it's not appropriate for us to discuss the, con the consultation in any greater detail, because it is still ongoing. And I just wanted to add, actually, Councillor Penfold mentioned that social care staff were not present at the drop-in. Social care staff have been present at every drop-in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the Green Group, please. Thank you. Question to Councillor Plant. Um, the Norwich Western Link we've heard news that we've heard this morning is the second piece of hard, bad news um, for the Council's road-building dreams in as many weeks. Uh, for decades, advocates of the uh, duelling the A47 have claimed that doing so is needed to increase, uh, deal with increased traffic. But the A47 Alliance's own study, which was revealed last week, um, found that traffic along the A47 has fallen by around 20% in along the stretches which were due to be dueled, um, and that's compared to a 3% increase nationally. So it's not just to do with the pandemic. So do you accept that you were wrong when you claimed that duelling is needed to cope with the increased traffic on the 847, just as you were wrong when you claimed that you were confident that Natural England would uh, uh, grant a licence for the Norwich Western Link? Thank you for your question. Um, it was disappointing to see you high-handing your neighbour when it was uh, announced, very joyfully. Sorry? When the, count, when the, the leader announced that the uh, Norwich Western comments, Link... Sorry, point about... I don't know what the Can member's referring the to there. Oh, sorry, sorry. The sorry. Thank you. The reason... I'm sorry, the question was about the A47 or about the Norwich Western Link? A47. So the question was, do you uh, acknowledge that you were wrong when you said that the that dueling the A47 would be needed to deal with increased traffic along the A47, given that your own study has shown that traffic has fallen in the last 10 years? No, not at all. I, I think that's what it's shown is that the pandemic did have an effect on it, and it is still recovering from the pandemic. Yes, it is, and the country is still recovering from the pandemic. There is growth designed to be built across Norfolk, which has been stopped at this particular moment in time by nutrient neutrality, but we're finding mitigations for that. There's an extra 40,000 houses to be built around Norwich, uh, and there's houses and development that needs to along the whole route of the A47. This whole route strategy for the A47 is about getting uh, goods and people east to west across the county, from, no from Lower Stoft and Great Yarmouth right through to the Midlands, and it's about making sure that we have a, a road system that is suitable for that. I don't know if you've been to the rest of the country, but if you go anywhere that isn't coastal, you will find that there's dual carriageways and ways for people to get about and do their business in a much more effective way than it is in any coastal region. The nearest motorway to this country, uh, to this county, is in Holland. We, have been, we haven't been invested in, in many, many years in this county, and uh, I'm really disappointed that there's a, um, there, there are blocks being put in the way to development within this county, but the people of this county deserve to have better infrastructure, they deserve to have better uh, roads, and I will campaign endlessly and fearlessly to make sure that the people of Norfolk do get what they, they want, and I, I'm sure that ours is the biggest party and they're going with our manifesto um, to get the infrastructure that's built throughout this county. And I will be an advocate of that, uh, while I'm a councillor at least, definitely. Just a point of explanation, thank Chair. Thank you very much. Um, the, the Cabinet member referred to previously... Uh, thank you, Jamie. I think, uh, thank Councillor Osborne. Chair. You've had your answer. Thank you very much. I'd like to correct some facts in the, council, in the Cabinet member's response. So he said that the that the fall in... Sorry, in, I, 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 I've answered the, the question. The fall Thank you in, very much. And I, I, if you want me to talk over you whilst you're trying to ask another question, I can continue to do that as well. But it's up to the chairman to, to make that res result. Start tit for tat. And any questions that you have, we come through the chair, please. OK. Thank you. And you haven't, I'm not allowing you to have another supplementary question. On this occasion, we're moving on. I now move to the Conservative group. Oh, sorry, Councillor Ward. Thank you. Uh, question for Councillor Eagle, please. 
Norfolk is well known in the film industry, with locations like Holcomb Beach and Thetford Forest being the choice of many filmmakers. Would the Cabinet Member for Economic Growth tell me how this Council can build on this to ensure we're at the forefront of filming locations in the entire country? Thank you for your question. I think we're already one of the um, prime locations within the country for filming. Um, as you've already mentioned with Thetford Forest, there's also Elm Hill in the city. You've got Holcomb in my area, there's Thetford and a widely associated with Dad's Army. And then Swaffham was a prime location for people when they did film such as, and was used as an for people to stay such as Kingdom and Hello Hello, which I remember well. Um, obviously, we've got a, a huge opportunity now, not just on that point, but to take forward. Because, uh, I think screen tourism in 2019 was worth 1.9 million to the Norfolk economy. I know it wasn't filmed in Norfolk, but it was based there, so we've got the Masters of the Air to come up for that as well. So we have huge opportunities, and we're really glad to appoint Norfolk Screen. So they will be taking this forward and widening what we can do and to make it a more seamless attraction for those people film studios or companies that want to come to Norfolk and film. So even to take on that spending, Spring Watch, a size of that company would spend about £4,000 per day where their location, and obviously they've been using Norfolk a lot for their filming. So we need to really push and widen what we can supply and make sure that all those extras, whether it's catering, hospitality, even the extras as you know as the people but all those equipments and little bits to finish the films whether it's classic cars livestock all that can be hard and if we have it in one centralized location so that studio whoever comes to see it goes straight to them and say oh we've got everything here in Norfolk you need so I think we've got fantastic opportunities this will take it forward I'm very glad that Councillor Jameson agreed with me and found me some little bit of extra money to take that forward and move it and the districts will be pleased to know, obviously, they get extra money from the licences for the films and what takes part as well. So there's money for all of us to benefit from. And I will just add on a little um, note that many years ago, when I was younger, I did some filming and hired out livestock like everyone else. And I was actually um, involved in a nude scene in um, one of the bits. So that should get most of you Googling for something else now <laughs> rather than anything else. And good luck Thank finding you. that one. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Eagle. Do you wish to add? Do you wish to add something to that, Councillor Weimar? No. No. Do you wish to add? No. No. no sorry, you're, it's not your turn now. <laughs> Thank you very much. We move on to round three, which is first of all the Liberal Democrat group. Thank you, Councillor Roper. Thank you, Chair. Follow that. Um, question is to uh, Councillor Vardy. Um, as with, with, with elections looming, um, the Conservatives, both nationally and locally, will no doubt parrot a line that flood prevention is a top priority, um, despite evidence pointing to the contrary. Does the Cabinet member agree with the evaluation recently of the current MP for North Norfolk? that the County Council is not doing enough to protect its residents from the effects of flooding, or does ultimate responsibility lie with the national government's pitiful handling of the issue? Yes, thank you for your question. Yes. Um, no, I don't agree with you, of course. Uh, but I think that, uh, you know, we, this as an authority, we've handled the last flood, the flood incidents, I think, in quite a dynamic way. We brought on board the... Uh, um, Norfolk Strategic Flood Alliance, which has become a pinnacle, a focal point for dealing with bringing agencies together to, uh, to, to, to the betterment of, uh, of our communities in that sense. One of the things you think about, what, what we have done as an authority, you look at uh, where, where we've uh, worked with uh, the Environment Agency, with DEFRA, and where uh, uh, residents were having issues with flooding and compensation and we come up with a memorandum of understanding with the uh, with the uh, 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 DEFRA so that instead of people having to residents having to wait for um, months to get compensation if not longer then now 
it's, it's, uh, there's up to £5,000 for them to be uh, to, 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 uh, uh, within weeks, shall we say. We've also, we're working now with our MPs. Um, we're, we're having a, a, you know, a flooding summit, so if you, if you, if you like, it's very soon. We've already approached the government uh, to, see for, for a, uh, uh, to, to see if we can get a uh, minister for flooding appointed to address this, um, uh, this matter. Well, we're working we're very hard. We're not only working with ourselves, we're working with the district councils. The whole thing is working. Now, climate change, as you know, um, is something that is an unknown factor. Right? We don't quite know how its impact will, will evolve in the future. I'm sure that it will. And I'm sure that we're putting in place now strategies, policies, uh, to, de to deal with that as we go forward for the betterment and protection of our, of our communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I move to the Labour group, please? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning. Uh, question for the leader, please. Um, yesterday, I had the pleasure of meeting with WASPI campaigners in Fetford. Uh, I'm very proud that a number of the Norfolk-wide uh, WASPI campaigners live in my division in Fetford. And we discussed the Ombudsman's report from last week, and we noted the leader's comments in the press last week. In the Labour WASPI motion, unanimously approved in this chamber last year, support was given for the campaign. Can I invite the leader to confirm the council's current position and specifically whether she agrees, as I do, that compensation should be given to women affected? Thank you, councillor. Um, this council was unanimous in supporting the WASPI women in their campaign to get compensation and I think it's really good news that that has actually finally happened. And I think this council will continue to support those women to ensure that they do receive that compensation in good time as well. Um, yes, you can always rely on my support in that measure. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jeremy. Uh, the Green Group, please. Thank you. Um, over the last few years, opposition groups have consistently asked whether there'll be a plan B for if the Norwich Western Link doesn't go ahead. So, for example, you know, plan B to try and um, improve transport to the west of Norwich. That scene has not seemed to have happened. Do you agree that it's now time to look at plan B, and what are you going to do about that? Are you asking the uh, Cabinet Member for Transport? Thank you. Yes, sorry. Thank you. No, there is no plan B. You can't put the traffic uh, differently down those roads um, unless you buy a whole load of farmland uh, they, they are country roads they are what they are and the Norwich Western Link is the only answer to those problems thank you very much now move on to the Conservative group Councillor Weimark thank you Jim uh, I've got a question for the cabinet member for adult social care um, Headway Norfolk and Waveney is a local independent charity dedicated to supporting individuals and families impacted by brain injury including stroke their latest pledge campaign, One Tick at a Time, aims to raise awareness about brain injuries. Is the Cabinet Member for Adult Social Care aware of this campaign? And if they are, would they share their views on Headway and the One Tick at a Time campaign? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Weimark, for the question. And, and yes, I am aware of the charities. They, they wrote to me um, just a short while ago um, and I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to raise this really important issue in the council chamber and would welcome um, all members of the council supporting the pledge. Um, most particularly, um, I think we need to acknowledge that brain injuries are probably far more common than we realise. Um, they affect individuals of all ages and backgrounds. They can be caused by accidents, or sport-related injuries. Any of us who's watched the recent Six Nations will wince every time there's a hard tackle, um, for an example. Um, but also there are medical conditions, and these injuries have significant and long-lasting impacts on the individual's physical, cognitive, and emotional well-being. Um, it's hugely important um, for us to support this project. Uh, most particularly because early intervention and identification is key. So we want to try and spread the word so that people who feel that they might have had uh, a brain injury um, and sometimes in the less 
commonly expected ways, but obviously somebody who's potentially had a stroke will probably know that. But somebody who's had repeated concussion or been knocked out on numerous occasions perhaps won't realise that they should um, seek medical support. Thank you very much. Well timed. Good. We've now out of time for the well, cap member cap questions to members of the Cabinet. Am but I not allowed to finish my answer then? No. <laughs> oh. Well, will you all sorry. sign up, please? I'll circulate it. Thank sorry, you. Sorry, Councillor Thompson. I, th I thought you had finished. <laughs> no, I hadn't finished. <laughs> well, go on, two minutes. Not even two minutes. Half a minute. Can I just Yeah. My apologies, you've totally taken my, oh. my drift now. <laughs> um, access to support services is very key and community awareness and support. So that's where members can come in to pledge your support, encourage organisations to incorporate the following questions into organisational forms, which asks people, have you ever had a history of a brain injury? Have you ever had multiple blows to the head? Or have you ever lost consciousness due to a blow to the head? So even if you hit your head on a tree... Um, you know, these kind of accidents and incidents that we brush off can have an accumulative effect. I will circulate the document and the um, pledge to all members, and I would ask you not only to sign the pledge, but to please circulate that without, within your communities and your parishes, because having, having been a nursing sister and cared for people who've had strokes um, and brain injuries, it's crucially important that we get help and support to people um, as soon as possible. Thank you. And thank you for the indulgence, Chairman. Thank you. I was getting a bit confused because I was just, it was, what was going through my mind was every time Wales lost at rugby. Sorry about that. That did cause me a headache. Not I'm, a sure headache it, I'm sure it probably did. <laughs> right, let's now move on to uh, item 10, which is recommendations from Scrutiny Committee and Norfolk Health Overview and Scrutiny Committee. No recommendations, so we'll move on to item 11. Recommendations from committees, no recommendations from committees, so I will now move on to item 12. And we will start with a report from the scrutiny committee meeting held on the 25th of January and the 14th of February. Councillor Morphew. Thank you, Chair. Happy to move that report. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> item 13, other committees, audit and governance committee, I believe Councillor Savage. Will respond to that. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, there is a, uh, a report from Councillor Mackey there, but I'd like to just uh, summarise a bit further uh, from my own point of view. Thank you. Um, the Norfolk Audit to Terms of Reference and Code of Ethics uh, was one item discussed. In, in summary, the Council is required to have internal terms of reference in order to contribute to the independence of the Audit Authority, and the Code of Ethics was uh, included there. The audit quarterly report confirmed that the overall opinion on governance, internal controls and risk management remains acceptable. The risk management report, two risks had score changes. Funded children's services overspend risk increased in likelihood from four to five. Uh, demand to manage statutory responsibilities risk reduced from four to three. The anti-fraud bribery and corruption report advised that a former assistant headmaster was convicted of fraud and sentenced to 10 months imprisonment, suspended for 18 months. Also reported were five cases where investigation of fraud is ongoing. The audit report results reported no outstanding issues requiring attention. The committee was happy to approve these reports and I move this report to council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Health and Wellbeing Board report for the meeting held on the 6th of March. Councillor Borrott. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, uh, I was away and uh, the Vice Chairman uh, stepped up and uh, chaired the meeting on my behalf. But there are a couple of things I would like just to draw the attention to um, members. Um, uh, critically, a, a piece of good news from the NHS Norfolk and Waveney Integrated uh, Care Board uh, the, uh, the, the NHS for Norfolk and Waveney has been moved out of the recovery support programme and is no longer in segment four. I think that represents a huge step forward and welcome progress um, within the um, ICS here in Norfolk and Waveney. Um, and I'd just like to thank all of the staff who've been involved, um, who have worked incredibly hard 
Uh, and ultimately, the system is there to serve the population of Norfolk and Waveney, and I'm really pleased um, that that has been recognised centrally by the NHS, that there has been a substantial improvement. Um, the second thing I just wanted to bring to the attention of members was the annual report from the Director of Public Health, um, and that this year focused on uh, vaping and tobacco control. And Norfolk County Council, as you remember, were one in the vanguard of looking at vaping, and the People and Communities Committee did consider this some months ago before the government announced uh, its uh, bill, and which has recently gone through Parliament. So I think it's really important to see the, um, uh, the report written by the Director of Public Health. I think it's a, a really uh, fantastic piece of work, and I think it's very, very relevant to us all today. So I'd ask members, um, if, they're not, if they are interested in this area, to, to have a look at it. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Thank you very much. Pensions Committee report from the meeting held on the 12th of March. Chairman is Judy Oliver, and um, she's not present here today, so uh, maybe the Vice Chairman wants to move that report. Ah, Councillor Richmond was the Vice Chairman. He sends his apologies. So, Can I move the report, please, Chairman? Thank you very much. Thank you. That solves that problem. Planning Regulatory Committee, Councillor Long. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, obviously, the report contained within today's agenda rate makes reference to the meeting that was held back on the 26th of January and the items that we dealt with at that point. I do, however, want to bring full Council's attention to the meeting that was scheduled to happen on the 22nd of March, this Friday just gone, uh, when unfortunately, due to a number of members uh, being taken ill uh, and at short notice, we weren't quarate. And this is the first time in my time at this council that a major committee hasn't been able to go ahead because of being in quarate. Um, we had me members uh, of the public and applicants and even a Suffolk County councillor due to speak to that meeting on uh, Friday uh, and unfortunately it wasn't able to proceed. And my plea to all councillors, and this is why I make this announcement at full council, is that please do undertake the planning training. You may feel that you might never need to substitute on planning, but we've had uh, members appointed to it who we literally haven't seen since their appointment, um, and we do need to be quiet to make those important decisions that we, that we deal with. Notwithstanding that, if all members were trained, any planning matters that came to the fore in their divisions they will have a much better understanding of the procedures uh, that we go through to make those decisions when we have to. Uh, and so that will help them in their divisional work. So uh, an urge to all, please, training sessions will be laid on, and I would like to see as many trained up as possible, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if we now... Chair. Chair. Oh, sorry. Chair, Chair, just to quickly comment on, on uh, Councillor Long's uh, statement there. I, I completely support it. It was very disappointing that we couldn't do the business of the council. And having that training will empower all councillors to be able to look at those planning applications in their ward and support the work of the council. I have spoken with Councillor Long before, but also the ability for local ward members to be able to call in items to the planning committees here at County is a facility that it do doesn't currently exist. And I believe that it's something that we do need to address so that we can have that local representation. Thank you, Councillor Long. Thank you, Councillor Price. Uh, just on that point, Councillor, and we are going to be putting together a member working group to look at the constitution and perhaps that's something that can be fed into that group. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now move on to the select committee reports. Um, corporate select committee, Councillor Rodri Oliver isn't here today. Um, is there anyone here who wishes to, oh, from that, the can I vice just chairman? Can yeah. I just move the report, please, chairman? Thank you very much, move the report. Um, Infrastructure and Development Committee, Councillor Bensley. 
Yes, thank you, Chair. Just got a couple of meetings just to update the full council on, please, if you don't mind. Uh, my first one was on the February the 23rd of this year. We had the adult learning annual plan, which was uh, very successful and noted. Also, the coastal erosion and flooding. Can I thank the leader on her support and help with that regarding Mr. Barclay and everything going down there? And can I also uh, underline that this was all cross-party, unanimous, helping each other, for, uh, Lib Dems, Labour, everybody, and thank Councillor Morphew for bringing this up at scrutiny as well. It's been from both uh, committees, us as Norfolk County Council, we are exploring all options and we will continue to work together with all levels of local government in pressing central government for our coastal community. So I'd just like to thank everybody for being so cooperative and helping on that. We had the waste service review also and supporting active and sustainable travel to schools and a, and a healthy forward working plan, which I always like saying. I will update on the 13th of March in a minute, but I just wanted to highlight uh, we always have a very healthy workload on the IND and I would like to thank all members and officers involved and previous members because I've got Councillor Webb unfortunately moved on, Councillor Akrone, he's moved on now to bigger and brighter things but uh, <laughs> it was always good to his listen to him and uh, Councillor Watkins sometimes, he, he always helped with ingenious inputs but as I said, what I do like with my committee is we are very cross-party working and we do uh, talk about stuff quite well, thank you. So just moving on to the next one, we had the Climate Action Plan, Tranche 3, the Trading Standards, Highways and Infrastructure Service Procurement, and the Countrywide Local Cycling Walking Plan. Lots to do, lots still more to do, and I thank all members for doing that. But I just want to finish off on some really, really brilliant news that we did have in our committee once, and that was the Norfolk Education uh, Awards, which was from the EDP, thank, thankfully, and uh, the council was the winner of the Higher and Further Education Provider of the Year. So well done to all the officers involved and all members here, and thank the EDP. That was a really good award, and the officers really gave them a new lease of life, and it's really good, and I just want to highlight that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, people in the Community Select Committee for Councillor Weimark. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted people to receive the report for the uh, 15th of March 2024. I just wanted to highlight the fact that this is, I think, probably one of the best meetings we've had at People and Communities, actually. <laughs> it really was. It was a really good level of scrutiny. Um, we looked at home to school transport, where we know, I think everyone knows in, in this chamber here, that there are enormous pressures on the system. And, and, and we're looking at the initiatives the council are putting in place to reduce travel time for young people and reduce costs, obviously, as well. Investing in, in special schools, uh, well, special schools, schools for special education needs and disabilities and specialist resource bases as well. I think it's really, really important that we look at all of the picture that makes up home to school transport. We are a huge county and it is an enormous challenge uh, ongoing, but we, we, I think we did a very good job there. And also we looked at fostering transformation. And once again, uh, I, I can say on behalf of, of, of the uh, committee, we were all very, very impressed by the work being undertaken and under the leadership of uh, Michelle Brady, a very vital so indeed. In fact, uh, <laughs> Councillor Jones wanted to give her several rises actually during the meeting. However, I, I would just say that the, the emphasis of, of the scrutiny and the questions asked was ensuring good quality in-house carers to reduce our reliance upon independent fostering agencies. It's so, so important. There's no doubt this, this transformation will improve the care of the children we look after. And I just want to say to everyone, we are all corporate parents, something every one of us sh should really sort of think about, because I don't think we do. So I really want to bring us back to that point, we are all corporate parents, we're all responsible for the children we care for. On the full work programme, we did discuss whether or not um, malnutrition should come to the People and Community Select Committee. We actually decided that it would go to the um, Norfolk Health Overview and Scrutiny Committee on the 11th of July. So if anyone wants to come and add anything then, please do. Okay, but thank you very much. It was an excellent meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor smith Clare. Thank you, Chair. I can only reiterate what Fran just said. It was an excellent meeting. Although, um, I must admit, for such an important committee focusing on so many key areas of council, I am concerned at the lack of business coming to it 
particularly as we now lose our May meeting. Thank you very much. I now move on to the um, report about the business and of joint arrangements and external organisations. Uh, joint Museums Committee, Councillor Ward. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> Pleased to move the report of the Joint Museums Committee on the 2nd of February. And I'd just like to uh, highlight the Royal Palace Reborn project update. Uh, the, the first of the three-stage handover has been completed with the return of the new school's entrance, toilets and changing place, and the pop-up cafe. The next stage for completion in a few weeks is the new entrance, the atrium, the cafe and the shop and full completion of the project will be sometime in the summer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Norfolk Records Committee, Councillor Chenery. I beg to move the report on the 2nd of February, Mr Thank Chairman. Very, thank you very much. Move on to item 16.1, pay and policy statement, and I call upon the leader to move the report. Thank you, Chairman. Um, this is a report that comes to us every year. We are required to publish a pay and policy statement. Um, there are no substantive amendments. There are a couple of small changes. There are three, in fact, which are on page 66. And uh, these amendments will bring the statement up to date. So I so move the report, Chairman. Thank you very much. Can I have a seconder for that, please? Thank you. Councillor Jamison. Councillor Morphew. Thank you, Chair. No problems with the um, uh, pay policy statement, but it does make a, a number of um, uh, statements within it about what we do and how we intend to do it. But what we don't ever see is any feedback or evaluation or assessment or figures about how we've lived up to the pay policy that we have. I'm not expecting an answer particularly today, but can I put it on the radar because I think it might be something that we ought to take forward so that we know whether or not we are actually achieving what we're setting out to do with the pay policy that we adopt. Thank you very much. All those in favour? Thank you. All those against? Abstentions? Thank you very much. That's passed. And I'll move on to uh, item 16.2, the climate policy for Norfolk. Um, and I call upon the Cabinet Member for Environment and Waste to move the report. Councillor Varney. Yes, thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, the UK has shown global leadership in efforts to tackle climate change being the first major economy to set a commitment to reach net zero law, into law in 2020. As a country, we have made substantial progress by halving emissions since 1990. The national trajectory towards net zero, set out in the carbon budgets agreed in by Parliament, will see a further stepping stone of reaching 78% reduction of emissions by 2035, compared to 1990 levels. Local authorities have a vital role in helping shape low carbon development in their areas in a way that reflects the local context and priorities. To this end, Norfolk County Council set out a, a comprehensive climate strategy in June 2023. And we're proud to have been independently ranked second amongst county councils uh, for our efforts on climate action. The climate policy I introduce uh, today looks at formally bringing this approach into the Council's policy framework to be owned by the whole Council. It also uses the opportunity to restate our county-wide vision to align more closely to the national trajectory towards reaching net zero by 2050. Let us not lose sight of the ambition this represents. We are aligning to a national trajectory that will halve emissions by 2035 compared to current levels with it uh, having to taken 30 years to our emissions since 1990, it will be no mean feat to do so again over 11 years. It will need the efforts of government, businesses and residents to achieve this. It sends a clear signal to government and businesses that Norfolk is open and ready for investment in clean infrastructure and boosting the local green economy. At the same time, it gives pragmatic recognition to the need for a balanced approach. This is uh, particularly with regard to the vital role of Norfolk's farming industry in national food production and how this will need to be reflected 
in the county's contribution to the national net zero target. The policy also restates our commitment to lead by example by making our own estate net zero by 2030. To date, we have cut our estate emissions by nearly 60% compared to the 2016-17 levels, and we strive to reach 90% reduction by 2030, with the remaining emissions being offset to hit net zero. I'm proud of what we have achieved so far. I believe the climate policy consolidates this by providing a strong policy foundation to keep building from. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, and thank you, Councillor Vardy. Um, I've said repeatedly that I think this is a really, really good climate policy, and I agree with a lot of the points that Councillor um, Vardy has made. When I first joined the Council uh, three years ago, Despite the fact that, that there was reference to area-wide emissions, the, the county whole emissions um, in the previous environmental policy, um, all the talk was on our own estate, which makes up less than 0.1% of, of the total emissions across the county. So it's really good to see that the shift, the focus has now shifted to housing, transport, land use, all the big areas where we can make a real, real difference. Um, and it's good to see that those are sort of outlined clearly in the policy. Uh, what I would say is that this needs to be backed up with clear targets. Obviously, there's the climate strategy, which sets out action plans, but it's hard to measure those against uh, progress because it's, it's currently lacking targets. So we, we do need that. And for example, you know, transport emissions have been increasing in Norfolk um, since in the last decade. Uh, so we need to be looking at ways to reduce those fast. Uh, we need to be looking at, at improving public transport, reducing dependence on cars, and improving active and public, tran active and, um, public transport. Um, Norfolk's actually got one of the highest rates of heat pump uh, uptake anywhere in the country. Four of the top ten local authorities at district level for heat pump uptake in England are in Norfolk, so it's very good news. But we need to be going 10 to 11 times faster within the next four years to meet government targets. So just to outline some of the scale of the challenge. And the key thing, you know, at scrutiny the other, the other day, one of the references was made to um, the cost of this and, you know, make, not putting burden on, on ordinary people. The key thing is to be focused on, on reducing costs for um, households because that is one of the, the key pal pillars of, of net zero. Um, final point that this is that this needs to be built into the MTFS, the medium term financial strategy. Um, so far, it's not really reflected in there, whereas other risks and other long-term commitments are. So that's a point for Councillor Jameson. Um, make sure that this is built as a key thread through the through the MTFS, please. Thank you very much. <coughs> Councillor Roper. Sorry, Councillor Watkin. Apologies. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I agree with uh, Councillor Osborne that there are some good things in the Council's climate policy, and I think that that is uh, broadly recognised despite our differences on declaring a climate emergency. Officers have worked hard to build up a set of impressive new initiatives that will help the Council achieve its net zero targets by 2030. However, many of us on the opposition benches are disappointed that the boldness and ambition which could have marked Norfolk out as doing different appears to have been diluted by merely committing ourselves to meeting the government's uninspiring national targets. And on that, I can't agree with Councillor Vardy when he says that the UK is showing global leadership. The Council will remain in an extremely challenging financial situation in the years leading up to 2030, and that will, by necessity, mean that money has to be spent carefully and wisely. That is why it is important that sensible safeguards are put in place within our policy framework to ensure that there is regular tracking of progress and that any shortfalls within any scheme can quickly be identified and remedied. And of course, regular member insight must also be an important part of that process. It's important that the Council continues to lead by example and be very careful not to dumb down on its leadership responsibilities across Norfolk. On scope three emissions, I see no reason why we shouldn't insist on stringent environmental standards 
within our own supply chain in order to complement what we are doing within our own estate. We should also be using our influence where it is likely to have the maximum influence and effect in shaping policy. And I refer in particular to the local transport and economic development sectors. There may be others. It's great news about the 70 new electric uh, buses in Norwich, but we must work ever more closely with local providers to improve sustainability across the whole of Norfolk. There's clearly the difficult issue of agricultural emissions. It will be challenging to get these down to net zero within the 2030 timeframe. They are difficult to offset, and that in turn will put more pressure on other sectors to compensate. We all recognise the importance of the county's farming industry and its vital role in food security across the UK. And balances will need to be struck, and it may well mean that a different approach will need to be considered for this sector. Finally, it's important that the Council equips itself with the skills to harness the growing opportunities of the green economy, to spur business growth and to help grow the sustainable tourism sector all the year round. Thank you, However, as we all know, the impacts of climate change will intensify. We must not lose sight of the essential need to protect local services as best we can, work ever more closely with our partners Thank you, to Walkins. improve your resilience time, time of Norfolk's up. communities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Aquaron. Thank you. Colleagues, we've made uh, undoubtedly good progress internally at this council, and I was on the member, site, member oversight group that drafted the current environmental policy, which it's proposed today be replaced by this one before us. One thing I was proudest of then was the resolution to take the lead across Norfolk in reducing our climate emissions. Uh, the current policy uh, says, striving to meet this collective global challenge, we will work with our neighbours within the region, specifically Suffolk, the Boards Authority, to achieve collectively net zero ambitions on our estates by 2030, but within also our wider areas, work towards carbon neutrality by 2030. Those words are struck out of the documents before you today, and two things have clearly changed in this new policy for the worst. The first is the year. This new policy kicks the date out by 20 years. If that isn't an admission of defeat, then what is? And the second is our leadership role. Although I welcome, as Councillor Osborne has observed, the highlighting of the areas of housing and transport as part of the needed Norfolk-wide approach, where is our leadership? As lead local authority, we keep giving up on this vital element. We've declined to take the lead on dentistry. We've declined to take the lead on tackling fuel poverty. And now we're going back on our word to taking the lead on leading Norfolk's climate emissions down to zero by 2030. Please, let's get back on track to an ambitious target that goes further than what is already provided for in law. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Kemp. Thank you, Mr Chairman. And I um, wholeheartedly support this climate change policy. And one of the most important areas is looking beyond our estate to addressing Norfolk's county-wide emissions. Because in Norfolk, and it was once described in this chamber, we're a, a car dependent, a car county. We have 40% of our emissions from transport, whereas nationally it's 28%. Nationally, 58% of car journeys are under five miles. And it's a, a requirement and a goal of our um, local transport plan to reduce these. And I see that this is an area that we need to be focused on because we're a very spread out area particularly in West Norfolk and North Norfolk and West Norfolk has the largest carbon footprint in Norfolk not through its own fault but it's villages that are very spread out and poor public transport links so I see that there's an imperative here to include in our targets that we should make it possible through public transport through the improvements of walking and cycling routes and public footpaths and so on that we should give every opportunity to people living not only in towns but on the periphery of towns and close and adjacent to towns, the opportunity to make their journeys by foot or by public transport or by cycle. I think this is very, very important and I think we should reaffirm our goal to make Norfolk carbon neutral by 2030. And I think this is achievable if we all work together and direct our efforts and the right government funding and other funding to what we need to do. And I would like to pay tribute to the 
West Norfolk, the, the, the Westland Action Group that's trying so hard to get its missing link of the footpath to the riverbank surface so that it would be able to walk and cut lots and lots of car journeys into Lynn. So I think this is what we need to be doing and we need to reassess projects which may not be delivering value for money like the South Gates project which, is, um, which has been declared by its project managers to increase congestion in Kings Lynn. That's clearly wrong and, and, and not appropriate use of public money when we could surface the footpath for just a quarter of a million pounds. I think this is very, very important, and I wholeheartedly endorse this, this project and policy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Jeremy. Thank you, Chairman. I just wanted to make a few quick comments. Um, firstly, I'd like to start by thanking uh, Eric Vardy for his leadership on this policy. Um, he was at the Corporate Select Committee meeting in January when we debated it, and I watched the Scrutiny Committee uh, meeting last week. Um, and I have always sensed or felt certainly that it's something that Eric believed in um, and he understood and he could uh, talk about uh, with passion. And I think that should be welcome. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, I will uh, vote for this document. Um, uh, however, I am a little bit frustrated that there's a few uh, key things in there um, that are missing. And I mentioned that the Corporate Select Committee meeting debated it and the Scrutiny Committee meeting debated it. The document before you today is exactly the same document that was presented in January. It's not been updated at all. We had a really good debate at Corporate Select with a whole number of members making contributions. Um, and there were some uh, interesting points made last week as well, but they haven't been incorporated. So I hope at some point this will be revised uh, so that those points can be taken on board. I hope it's, excuse the pun, a living document because actually uh, there was a number of good comp uh, contributions from all members. Uh, I won't repeat the points I made in January, but one uh, specific thing which I think is uh, missing to some extent is around farming. It doesn't talk about farming nearly enough for a large county like Norfolk where farming is uh, absolutely key. Um, where I am in uh, Breckland, um, farmers are one of the cohorts of people who are particularly affected by climate change. It's difficult enough, frankly, to, to, to farm on some of the, the soil that we've got. That will be made uh, significantly worse through uh, climate change. But also farming has a really big opportunity to make an impact when it comes to uh, changing the way they operate to support um, a reduction in carbon emissions. And we as a county council have a really unique position when it comes to um, the county farms estate to be a real leader um, uh, UK-wide in uh, uh, demonstrating our commitment and our approach um, and acting as a, as a sort of an exemplar, if you like. So yes, I will support it. It is a good document, uh, and I hope in the future it can be an even better document. But thank you for your work on it. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Long. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Notwithstanding the comments that have been made thus far, um, I will begrudgingly accept and vote for this uh, report. I say begrudgingly, at the scrutiny committee, I made specific reference to the fact that the people of Norfolk shouldn't have to fund world climate change adaptation. We need to get Norfolk's house in order, but we cannot go beyond what is required to deal with our own part of the problem. And blindly heading into an ever uh, uh, more environmental future at the detriment of the people of Norfolk financially is not my idea of the right way forward. And so as this is an evolving document and as this will, will be uh, something that uh, adapts over a period of time, that particular addition, and I'm not going to propose that it's an addition now but that needs to be we, we need to be mindful of that in all that we do towards uh, adaptation and uh, evolving our thinking of climate change i personally believe that climate change will be dealt with by innovation and not taxation thank you thank you very much councillor hemsel thank you chairman um Councillor Long actually said a lot of what I was going to say already. I really congratulate Councillors Vardy, Plant and James on what they have done for this council in enabling our journey towards net zero. The UK, as has been outlined, is already a global leader when it comes to reducing emissions. And as Councillor Long has outlined, that it is not Norfolk's place or role to ensure that we carry the can for the rest of the world. 
the journey to net zero has to be enabled and cannot be, as some parties would have, a, raw, a war on motorists, a war on businesses, and paying farmers to grow weeds instead of food for our people. So again, I congratulate this council, this cabinet, on their leadership in this area. And, and Eric, you've done a sterling job, and I, I really congratulate you on this. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Got no other questioners? So we go back to Councillor Jamison, who seconded it. Uh, thank you, Chair. So the, uh, the general purpose of, <clears throat> of this climate policy before you uh, today is uh, to bring that climate strategy into the Council's um, uh, policy framework. So it is now to be owned by the whole Council. It uses this opportunity to restate our ambition for the county and it aligns Norfolk uh, more closely to the 2050 uh, net zero trajectory rather than the, the climate neutrality by 2030 statement which was made in 2019 before, uh, before the um, uh, uh, new uh, w uh, methods of, uh, of judging that trajectory can be made. So it's worth bearing in mind just for context uh, that the country overall has roughly halved uh, its emissions since 1990 and it will halve again by 2035. But I think it's really important uh, that this paper gives pragmatic recognition of Norfolk's farming sector. Norfolk's farming sector is a key part of national food security. It's a key part of our economy, of course, as well. Our land use emissions uh, from farming, our uh, carbon-rich and fertile soils, will reflect this. Uh, but we uh, must make sure uh, that uh, uh, Norfolk's uh, path to net zero is seen in the context of national interest. And uh, um, at, at present, uh, there is no framework. We talk about frameworks for measurement. There is no framework for measuring local contributions uh, to the national 2050 net zero target. I think Cambridgeshire County Council has received funding to develop a blueprint for this over the next 18 months, and we'll follow that progress with interest. Other than that, I uh, heartily um, second this report. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Chair, a point of order, please. Point Sorry, of order? Yes, Councillor Morphy. Thank you. Um, this is not intended as a hostile point of order. Uh, I did raise it in the scrutiny committee and it is in the uh, report of the scrutiny committee. Part five of the constitution um, refers to the policy framework and budget. And um, if I can quote from it, all policies in the strategic framework will be dated and include a date when they will expire and dates when the policy will be reviewed and reported against targets as appropriate. Um, I did ask for that to be included um, in today, and it is prerequisite for it to be part of the policy framework. So perhaps if somebody can tell me the answers to those questions, we can get them in the minutes um, of the meeting today, and that will make sure that um, everything is properly constitutional, and then we can all vote for this um, uh, policy. Thank you very much. Councillor Vardy, if you'd like to sum up and perhaps uh, relate or include some of the, uh, the, an answer to Councillor Morphew. Yes, I think, uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yes, and thank you, Councillor Morphew. Um, I think it is relevant. I think we should, this policy should be reviewed, and I think that it should be reviewed at a date. I'm, I'm going to pluck one out of the air and suggest to you that it might be included in the minutes. Although we can't change this policy today, uh, per se, this is set, uh, but uh, I would suggest that it's reviewed in uh, two years' time, uh, which I've got the nod from, uh, from our legal... Um, uh, people, uh, so I would like that to be added to the minutes that uh, that uh, this is reviewed in two years' time. And, and again, thank you, Councillor Morphew. It's a very relevant point. Uh, before, but th this policy is not about um, it's about future generations. It's not so much about us. It's about future generations. We all know that climate change, as it goes forward, can have some dramatic effects on this on our landscapes and our communities. Um, uh, uh, various, in, and we're seeing evidence of this as we go forward. 
But before I close for the vote, I would just like to thank uh, uh, the, uh, the members of uh, the select committees, scrutiny and, uh, of course, cabinet, uh, for their positive inputs. There will be a report to this council um, in the autumn of this year showing the progress that we've made to date on the action plans that are committed in the, uh, the three tranches that, have, uh, that are going through governances or being through or going through governance. <laughs> So you will have a date, you will have a time then to reflect on uh, how we're performing. Look, we've got, nothing's going to be gushed out in one day. We know that in, in a few months. But we are working, we're striving. And I say, I've had some really good um, um, inputs from those committees I've just spoken about. And I think, I hope that continues as we go forward. Because this is not about politics, really. It's about the future. So thank you, Chair. I move the report. Thank you very much. <coughs> All those in favour? Thank you. All those against? Abstentions? That report is passed. Thank you very much. Um, because of the time, it's only uh, 10 to 12. It was my intention to move on to uh, motion one before we have a break. If that's, if that's okay with members, yeah. Thank you very much. In that case, we'll start the, the motions and we'll look at motion number one, uh, which is proposed by the Conservative group. And I call upon Councillor Fitzpatrick to move it. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, as the preamble to this motion mentions, walking and cycling are, of course, considered among the most effective ways of promoting regular physical activity. And this is something that's already set out in the County Council's ambitious walking, wheeling and cycling strategy. Now, for many years, health professionals have been telling us that those who engage in healthy exercise and activity choices can experience better health outcomes, and of course, it's never too late to start. And interestingly, companies who encourage their employees to make these changed lifestyle choices find they experience not just the lower staff turnover, but also reduced levels of absenteeism. Um, they find it brings improved productivity and gives improvements of employee morale. And yet many years ago, it seems many years ago, when I worked in central London, I regularly cycled to work, I have to say, um, particularly on the nice spring days, not quite so much in winter where I took the bus. But um, I was lucky because my employer had lots of cycling racks and pleased to say good showers, and I think that was something my colleagues were particularly relieved about. Um, but those who cycle in towns know that it can be quite entertaining during rush hour. We go hurtling through along the cycle lanes. We overtake the cars, which are usually stationary, or they're just crawling along. And it's probably quite safe, probably safer in most towns and large areas to cycle at rush hour because the traffic trundles along at the same speed as it was when it was all horse-drawn, which is about seven miles an hour. The downside then was seeing the fumes from the slowing moving vehicles, um, and that's something that's reduced in recent years. A good few years ago, I moved from Norfolk, and after a few weeks, I thought I'll cycle to my office um, in Faken, on which I now represent. So I'd expected some idyllic doddle along country lanes into a local market town. Instead, I found drivers speeding past and extremely close, and I rapidly started to look for alternative routes to avoid roads as much as possible. That wasn't an easy thing for someone relatively new to the area, and something that visitors probably find difficult as well. And the same, of course, goes for finding footpaths, for walks off the roadways, and um, so it's not always the easiest thing to do. So that's why I'm pleased to be proposing this motion that provide a parish path information pack, make it easy for people to find these routes, and importantly, we'll work with stakeholders to achieve it. So I think most of us, if not all of us, welcome the news of the £200 million government fund to improve walking, wheeling, and cycling routes. It'll go a long to way towards reducing admission, help local economies, and create jobs. And it builds on that ambitious a commitment that exists to make half of all journeys in towns and cities being cycled or walked by 2030, which is not that long really now. And um, I think changes in priorities has been startling, making that easier. So it's good that this fund is something that fits well with this council's existing local cycling walking infrastructure plans, which of course are already in place in many areas across our county. Um, 
I think I speak for everyone saying this council welcomes the scheme for over a million pounds to be distributed across Norfolk. And I'm pleased to say it's something that fits well with the work already being done by our Norfolk MPs. In particular, I should perhaps mention the work of Duncan Baker, the MP for North Norfolk, who of course practiced what he preaches by running marathons, benefiting charities as well as his health. And I hope this keeps him fit and healthy as he continues, we hope, to represent Norfolk from, North Norfolk for many years to come. So thank you to Duncan from all of us for that consistent work in helping increase public access to footpaths, urban, rural and coastal. So, just to round up, we want to maintain our work alongside parish councils to continue to ensure that local applications for actual travel routes and walking routes are successful. We um, want to update the parish information pack to make it accessible and reflect recent initiatives for sustainable transport and physical activity. So, this motion really sets out in a nutshell what we want to achieve. So some might say, well, why don't we just hand out a ready-made pack, toolkit, shortened version or whatever, um, and term anyone wants to use. And the reason we're not doing that, the reason we're do we want to do it with this consultation with stakeholders is because we believe it's important to consult and work together with as many stakeholders as possible. So that's rather than draw something down from the centre, we actually want to draw on the local knowledge, which um, particularly parish councils and more rural areas have of paths and best ways to go. And um, that's why we want to draw on that. That's why we want that new paths information pack. And um, that's why we want to work with NALC and local councils to achieve that. So I ask you to support the motion that this council will ask the cabinet member for highways and infrastructure and transport to engage with the Norfolk Association of Local Councils to canvass its members on how best to meet this aim in relation to footpaths and public rights away, undertaking and adopting best practices and producing a new parish path information pack that's fit for the future. With all that's gone on before, I commend this motion and hope everyone in this chamber will support it. Thank you. Uh, I'll wait till later, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I'd like to propose an amendment, please. Can we... I think it's been circulated. Shall I speak while it's uh, being brought up? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll say my piece, save us time, and uh, say what I want to say. Colleagues, I'm delighted to see this motion before us today, um, which commits to improve local walking routes, cycling and wheeled routes across uh, the county. This is the result of a three-year project that I have led on, engaging and working with partners like NALC, County Council officers, the National Farmers Union, Countryside Alliance, the Country Landowners Association, and the Ramblers. And I'm pleased that this motion is the result of working cross-party with the administration, even if some unfortunate party political posturing has crept into the draft. And somehow the people proposing it have changed from myself and Councillor Jamison to Councillors Fitzpatrick and Elmer. Nevertheless, I was inspired to help make it easier to establish walks following a letter I received in lockdown from a group of young people in Melton Constable. They wrote to me to tell me how frustrated they were with the lack of local footpaths. Melton Constable is a fantastic village in the heart of our rural community with allotments and play equipment and shops and drink and food outlets, but like so many villages, it lacks circular walks that residents of all ages can enjoy safely away from the risks of rural roads. But it's not for lack of potential. Often there are just one or two things stopping a circular walk from being possible. It might be a broken asset, or an unmaintained footpath, or just a short stretch that needs a negotiated agreement with a landowner. And so in 2021, I started consulting with all these parties, with parishes, landowners, and others, and realized that all the pieces that need to make it easier for communities to establish these routes already existed. They just weren't gathered together in the same place in an easy to use way. There is a common desire to work together to improve local access. I've also seen evidence of best practice right throughout the process, from the way people have approached auditing the current paths and blockages, 
through to legal agreements for permissive access that could be turned into templates, uh, to include some brilliant leaflets promoting walking routes. I also learnt from stewardship organisations how important it is to let people know how to access the countryside responsibly and safely. Updating this council's already extensive footpath documentation is a great way for us to help communities improve things for themselves. And our amendment strengthens the specifics of how this work should create a simplified information pack that includes the tools that people can use in order to order issues, improve existing access, establish new permissive access, and publicise and promote paths. I commend both this amendment and the motion as a whole to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do you accept the amendment, Councillor Fitzpatrick? Uh, no, Chairman, I don't, because it merely echoes what the motion already says. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have a second for your... Councillor Colwell, are you seconding the, the uh, amendment? Thank you. Do you wish to speak now, Councillor Colwell, or wait until later? I'd like to just say a few words now, if I may, Thank Chair. You Thank much. you very Carry much. Carry on. Yeah, I, I want to uh, express my thanks to Councillor Aquarone and the wider Liberal Democrat group for working so hard on what is um, really a, a Liberal Democrat motion which has been been, 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 been dressed up. Um, uh, I want to also um, just express my support uh, for this because I get regular emails from uh, people around West Norfolk that feel that uh, we need to move faster as a county in relation to um, making it easier and attractive for uh, people and safe for people to use active travel. In West Norfolk, we have people that would, would, would relish the opportunity of being able to um, get around easier. We have a very difficult problem, the A149. It prevents people in Kings Lynn and West Norfolk being able to either get one way or the other. So it, it is something, whilst at the moment we have arrows that are marked on a map of tentative ideas, things, uh, aspirations of this council, I think we need to speed that up. So I really welcome this, this initiative um, and um, I, I want to, to, to thank uh, those that have worked uh, so hard over the last three years to get this to this council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Rowett. I'd like to speak in favour of this amendment. It's good to have the opportunity to improve this motion by importing a small part of the better motion that was scheduled for later in the agenda. That's so a shame that we have to discuss and vote on the inferior copy motion before the better archetype. Um, I'd like to pay tribute to the fantastic voluntary work done by parish councils and parish footpath wardens who are fighting valiantly to try to preserve our wonderful heritage of off-road rights of way. We need to make it easy for villages and communities to access safe routes away from the dangers of speeding vehicles. We need to give them support in defending their rights of way. I shall be deeply disappointed if there are councillors present today who vote against this amendment. Thank you very much. Councillor Mason Billy. Thank you. Um, it's a shame this has all descended into some sort of Thank party you. political tit for tat, and it shouldn't be like that. Um, Footpaths are not the exclusive domain of the Liberal Democrats. Uh, I myself am very fortunate to have part of the Wherryman's Way in my county division. And uh, although some of that runs alongside the River Chet and therefore is prone to disappearing into, into the river, um, usually about once every 20 years, it's something that the local population and I have been working towards resurrecting and I'm pleased to tell you that we have now managed to restore the banks and we should see uh, new bridges being put in place and that circular part of, of the walk being reinstated. Um, during the pandemic, people became more aware of public rights of way and footpaths. It enabled them to escape the confines of their houses and it was one of the only good things to come out of COVID and people valued their freedom that they could gain from using the footpaths in their areas to get out in the countryside not only promoting healthy activity, but opening people's eyes to the beauty of our county. So of course we want to promote parish paths and this new information pack and, and uh, an updating of that. However, I think the amendment, all it does is sort of recreate the last line of the original motion. And I think it would be wise to wait until we have managed to engage with NALC and, and other interested parties before we decide exactly what we're going to be producing um, otherwise, we tie our hands, and that's why I can't support the amendment. 
Thank you very much. Councillor Borrett. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, when I um, was the Cabinet member responsible for footpaths, one of my proudest achievements was the joining up of the long-distance footpaths which enable you to walk from Kings Lynn to Great Yarmouth, or, if you prefer, Great Yarmouth to Kings Lynn, um, which previously wasn't been possible. And for, um, at that time, to get full council's agreement to invest in the long-distance footpaths that almost completely circumnavigate Norfolk and joined up a lot of the long-distance footpaths, a lot of uh, investment and time and effort was put in to uh, Norfolk's footpaths at that time. And I'm, as, as I say, it was one of my proudest achievements when I was the cabinet member responsible. So I do find it a bit, um, uh, a bit odd to be told that uh, footpaths are the purview of a particular group and not of this whole council. And uh, I think that's disappointing, really. Um, as cabinet member for uh, public health and well-being, I absolutely support this opportunity um, and this motion that people um, adopting healthier lifestyles uh, and spending time uh, walking in the open air and nature is, is really important. It's not just for physical, but also for mental well-being. Um, and uh, those of us who were born and brought up in the country walk large distances anyway, but those who have not been so lucky, uh, and I say lucky because I think it's a real privilege to have been uh, brought up in the countryside, um, that I spent waste no time in extolling the, the virtues of spending time uh, out in the fresh air, in the weather, and in uh, nature, as so many of our, our lives today are sedentary and based indoors where you, you don't actually feel the rain against your skin. So uh, this, I think, is really excellent. I have no hesitation in supporting it. It is an important part, I think, of people's health and well-being. Um, and I don't, just so we're clear, as my colleagues just remind me, I'm supporting the motion, not the amendment. <laughs> <laughs> so I will not be supporting the amendment. Just to make, make myself clear, I will not be supporting the amendment, but I will be supporting the principle of this. Um, and I do hope that the whole of the council can come together and support the original motion, because I think it is something that everybody agrees, uh, undeniably, it is a positive step. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Councillor Penfold? Yes, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I do agree with Councillor Borrett that um, footpaths are the remit of the whole council. Of course they are, and that seems to me the, that was why the original motion, and I mean the one that came to us last for council, was proposed by Councillor Aquarone and seconded by, uh, or was in, he said he would second it, Councillor Jameson. So that seems to me, uh, you know, that cross-party motion, that approach, is a much better way to do things, exactly the point that Councillor Borrett just said. It sends out a better message. I'm struggling to understand why Councillor Jameson pulled his support on that. Well, it's politics, which is bonkers, and it's just come back as a Conservative motion. That's a great shame, because had we uh, voted on it as a cross-party mo motion, I think it would have been uh, a lot more powerful. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have no further questioners at the moment, so I call upon Councillor Fitzpatrick just to... Uh, Sum up the, the amendment. I don't think. I don't <laughs> yes, it's a right of reply. I'm happy to do so. It's a right, of, a right of reply. Yeah, right well, reply. I think it's been said by so many, it's, it's a shame to just try and make this party political. But I don't see anything in the amendment. All it does is, as I said earlier, it simply and I've, I've heard nothing in the, some of the other echoes, but it merely echoes and restates what's in the initial motion in different ways. I don't see ads to it, and for that reason, I won't be voting for it, and that's why I didn't accept it in the first place. Thank you. Thank you very much. So in that case, we'll move to a vote on the amendment. Chair, before you do, can we just clarify this business about the right of reply on um, amendments, please, because I'm not convinced you got that right, and I don't really want us to get into a muddle. So maybe I have this wrong, but let's go with it. So 12.9 in the Constitution, right of reply. 
Uh, if an amendment is moved, the mover of the original motion has the right of reply at the close of the debate on the amendment, but may not otherwise speak on it. Thank you. Okay. Happy with that. Thank you very much. Uh, Alex, can you prepare the vote, please? Thank you very much. That looks as though the voting is finished, and that is um, 422 against 37, abstentions none, so the amendment is lost. Thank you very much. We now return to uh, the debate on the substantive motion. Councillor Plant. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, it's a, a really good. Uh, motion to be perfectly honest with you I, I I am very aware that for the last 14 years we've had the parish partnership whereby we match fund schemes across the parishes right across the county um, and at this year alone we've got a million just over a million pounds which is going to be spent on parish partnerships to put in what the parish have asked for that they see as being important to them and this could be an extension of that. At the end of the day, we've got those contacts now with the, the parishes. We have uh, a good baseline to work from. We have the, uh, the members have their 10,000, 11,000 now pounds a year that they can spend locally within their areas. So there's a good base for doing this. So I think it's, a, it's, a, it's one of those things that is a natural progression, I would have said, of where we are anyway. Um, it is asking a cabinet member, me, to engage with Norfolk Association of Local Councils, which I do, uh, to canvass its members on how to best meet this aim in, in relation to footpaths and public rights of way. I have to say that we do an awful lot on public rights of way already. We are uh, very keen to work with parishes, as you know, through the parish partnership. And I think Councillor Acheron has, has identified something that we've been doing for the last, you know, something that I brought in when I was cabinet member back in the day, um, 2014, 2013, something like that about parish partnerships and the idea is that we improve the ability of people in those parishes to get about to meet up with the next parish to meet up with the next town to try and create some connections that uh, weren't there in the first place so I think alongside the parish partnership that's already on the go and um, working with those with every parish um, I'm quite uh, looking forward to adopting a new parish partner pack information pack. So, yeah, I haven't got a problem with it at all. I think it's a great idea. I think parishes need it. Um, they would then understand how other parishes get stuff that they don't, because you you you, you tend to get in the in the uh, county a thought that other people get things that we don't. Why don't we get them? Well, again, it, it, it's about how you apply, who you apply to. It's about your local member, how involved they are. There's an awful lot of disparity I think bringing in this pack will will close that disparity and help parishes uh, do the best they can for the people within their areas so I support this uh, motion chairman thank you very much councillor long yes thank you chairman uh, obviously I welcome this uh, motion I'm never a fan of policy being di um, dictated to by notice of motion I feel that they are better developed through select committees and the scrutiny process um, and I would urge the cabinet member, if this is accepted, to include within his thinking um, that uh, parishes within information packs that they may produce are minded to um, identify routes that are particularly suited to those in wheelchairs, mobility scooters, and those that have uh, other difficulties in their in their ambulance uh, and uh, I, I say that as someone who struggles on uneven surfaces um, and uh, steps and so on uh, and um, I think that will aid those folk that want to access the countryside and and uh, get the best out of this uh, who aren't necessarily so uh, well abled 
as the majority. Uh, and so, obviously, I will support it, and I'll put that as a little plea for, those, for that element of the society uh, that, that um, where possible, routes are identified as uh, disability-friendly, ambulance-friendly, um, so that folks can um, uh, access with the knowledge that they're not going to get in a position where they end up stuck and then needing further assistance. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Rowett. Frankly, I'm staggered that the Conservative group is wasting our time with a party political broadcast for their outgoing MP for North Norfolk. <laughs> no, we're not impressed when they parrot government claptrap about generous funding for active travel. In reality, this council is starved of funding. It can't address even a tiny proportion of what the Conservatives call the wants and needs of local communities. It can't fulfil its basic duties to enforce footpath rights of way promptly and effectively. It's nowhere near on track to meet the target of 50% of urban journeys being active travel by 2030. It sinks large amounts of active travel money into expensive road schemes that only make things worse for cyclists. As Councillor Fitzpatrick observed, the people in rural places in Norfolk would like their roads to be safe for walking and cycling and riding horses. This motion does nothing to address the problem of speeding vehicles on country roads. This motion takes us nowhere towards shifting car journeys onto active travel. Obviously, we'll always vote in favour of active travel and access to footpaths, but we're really not interested in boasting about the Conservative government's generous funding, which is actually a continuous round of austerity and cuts. I propose that we waste no further time on it and move at once to the vote. Thank you very much. Councillor Jeremy. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I was actually really pleased when the Constitution was amended some time ago, um, and it meant that the Conservative group motion would be heard first. Um, I was pleased because at least we could take part in a debate in this chamber on a motion that had some chance of being uh, successful. <laughs> Um, and then uh, I was a bit disappointed, as usual, when I read the agenda and I looked at this particular motion, and I'm sure, like many members, I go to the end of the, the motion to see what the actual proposal is to do something. Um, and I, I read the last section here in the motion, and it says that this council will ask the Cabinet Member for Highways to engage with the Norfolk Association, Association of Local Councils. Surely that should be routine. We don't need a motion at full council to have a conversation with NALC. I mean, they are the representatives of town and parish councils in Norfolk. I think they should be on your regular list of people that you talk to, regardless of this motion. And then the second and, and final uh, action uh, coming from this motion is to produce a new parish park paths information pack. We need a motion to produce an information pack. No wonder it takes forever to get anything done around here. I mean, it's... <laughs> It's crazy. Um, so uh, not only do we have a motion that doesn't really do anything, we have a motion from one group that isn't even their own. It sounds like it was borrowed or stolen or recycled, depending on who you speak to, from the other group. So I'm um, just disappointed, really, that it's a motion from the, the, the ruling group of this council that doesn't really achieve anything, isn't really their own. Um, I will say, however, I am pleased with uh, Councillor Long's uh, uh, intervention and contribution because he is at least consistent. This absolutely should have been something that went to a select committee. We've heard today how one select committee isn't even meeting next due to lack of business. No wonder, because they keep coming to full council in the form of motions. We have select committees for a reason, and we should be using them. I, I, you know, I have no reason to doubt the, the importance of uh, parish paths and uh, walking and cycling and all the rest of it. But if it takes a motion to get anything done around here, then we really are wasting our time. Thank you very much. I have Councillor Vardy and Councillor Hemsell, and then we will, in fact, move towards the vote. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Yes, and mine won't take long. Uh, whilst a lot of motions brought before this Council um, are, are uh, brought without uh, evidence, not desirable, uh, deliverable or affordable, I will be supporting this motion because it's all of those things. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Hemsell. But Chairman, again, I'm going to support this motion, and the reason for it is that I find that um, often larger settlements are blissfully unaware of smaller settlements' needs to connect with them, um, especially by active travel. I see evidence of this in my division, and that's why I'm fully, full-heartedly supporting this motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Uh, Councillor M. Elmer, would you like to uh, speak now? Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I'd like to start by saying I fully agree with Councillor Acarone. It is deeply frustrating when the business of this council gets co-opted to serve the needs of parliamentary candidates. Um, but separate to that, I, I do genuinely, genuinely um, support the motion. Um, as Councillor Billig said earlier, COVID revealed to an awful lot the value of walking and I became an absolutely ardent believer in getting my 10k a day in at the time. And since the rollout of Beryl Bikes, I've even managed to get on those a few times. I know. Unfortunately, my commitment to supporting small rural businesses is such that I never actually lose weight via the excursions. But um, it's not just the physical benefits of walking and cycling the help. It's also the mental benefits, as Councillor Borrett alluded to. The Mental Health Foundation says that just 10 brisk minutes of brisk walking a day can significantly improve your energy levels, your mental alertness and your mood. Um, and also, I think, as we've said before, and ha as we have to remind National Grid on such a regular basis, um, we have a fantastically beautiful county, and we want to make sure that as many people can get out to experience that as possible. So um, I'm very happy to commend the motion to you. Thank you very much. Councillor Fitzpatrick, would you like to sum up? Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll keep it short. I, I really did think this would have cross-party support, and I do think it's a bit hilarious mm -hmm. when... I'm accused of being party political um, when I hear some of the things that, be, that do get said in this, this chamber. I sometimes wonder whether I'm in Norfolk County Council or the trainee school for aspirant MPs. But um, that's... I, I'm a simple soul. Some people just think I'm simple. But, um, you know, I think in the past, you know, the opportunities um, taken to, to mention, or oh, when I'm the next MP for wherever... Um, hope springeth eternal. Um, I actually have a high attendance at my parishes and I deal a lot with people and I go to events. Um, I was actually, uh, my part of my commitment, I'm not sure it goes well with this motion, but I spent, um, I spent most of the day on Saturday volunteering at the excellent Fakenham Beer and Gin Festival. Um, but that's, but it's, you know, we, we do keep in touch and, and using NALC, using parish councils, I, I get, I, there's nothing nothing that we should be ashamed of about doing that. Um, so I see this and working with NALC as, as a plus. Um, but health, that's the reason for this. It's important to us all. It's something, as we've said, being pushed by health professionals. Over the years, the number of people taking exercise has increased, but perhaps not enough, um, because obesity continues to be a problem right across the developed world. Um, you know. COVID perhaps pushed the demand um, as people wanted to take exercise during lockdown. And I think it's a real plus that this demand has continued. Um, you know, it was almost Augustinian, its concept of good out of evil, but it, it's good that something like that has kept that momentum going and it's gratified that it's continued and that people continue to walk and cycle more. I don't think I mentioned horses, but um, um, I'm sure happy to mention. Uh, I'm not... Um, that, but it's, I think it's really important to work with stakeholders. It's good we can use the parish partnership money. Um, and it's good to, that the, the echo, uh, this is council chamber, I thought, when I listened to someone, I thought it was maybe the echo chamber. But um, I would urge everyone to vote for this motion because it surely is an aspiration of every single person in this council chamber. And I hope there'll be no one that abstains or votes against it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alex, can we uh, prepare the vote, please? Thank you. It looks as though that's now finished. So uh, the votes are 4, 46, against none. 47, sorry, for 4, just gone up again. Um, and 13 abstentions. So the motion is carried. Thank you very much. Um, we will, it's, the time is 12.20.
We will have a 20 minute break and resume at 20 to 1. Thank you very much.
Uh, 45 minutes left of normal time. So we'll see how we get on during the, that period. And Chair, move on to motion two. Chair, could I move that we extend the meeting by an hour, please? <coughs> you certainly can move a motion that we do. Have you a seconder? Thank you very much. Chair, to confirm, if this doesn't go through, that you're saying that it's 1.32 before you close the meeting. Is that the time that you're, you're agreeing? Yeah. Yep, okay. 1.32. Thank you very much. Okay. We've got a proposal in a second that we, in, we extend the meeting and for a further hour. All those in favour? Against? That's more than, that's more than the, 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 the ones in favour, so we will not be extending the meeting any longer than the normal three hours. Thank you very much. Motion two, uh, proposer, uh, this is a Lib Dem group motion. Councillor Colwell, if you would like to uh, propose the, the motion. Yes, please, Chair. Thank you. Uh, there is a great deal of anger over the recent decision by the Planning Inspectorate to grant the development consent for the Wisbeach incinerator. I understand this anger. When important decisions of this scale are taken by central government, bypassing local people and their elected representatives, it's no wonder the community feels let down and ignored. We in West Norfolk know all too well about the lengths that have to be gone to to ensure due process is followed and to call out erroneous decisions. Over a decade ago, a referendum took place and over 62,000 people said no to incineration in West Norfolk. A public inquiry followed and the incinerator was eventually thrown out. It will not have escaped the notice of this chamber that there were issues with the approval process and decision which was made, then removed, then confirmed 24 hours later. It seems an irrational decision with prevailing winds from the Wisbeach blowing towards West Norfolk this new proposed incinerator could impact a significant proportion of the population of our county. I share the worries of the community about the effects of those particular emissions which cannot be cleaned by filters, on the health of local people, as well as the potential adverse impacts on grade A food production land, a delicate sites of special scientific interest, such as Royden Common and the Wash, and at the very least, we are taking an enormous risk by creating a hungry monster on our doorstep, which may have serious adverse effects on the surrounding community for many years to come. I suspect the site of the Wisbeach, of Wisbeach, a town with significant pockets of urban deprivation, digital exclusion, and high migrant population, was chosen precisely because developers thought that the residents wouldn't have the strength to oppose them. Well, how wrong they were. The tireless campaigning of Wiswin against the incinerator have proved that the Fenland community share the fighting spirit West Norfolk showed over a decade ago and in opposing that incinerator in Kings Lynn. They came here as a group to County Hall in 2022 and their determination, as well as several councillors in this room, persuaded this council to unanimously vote to oppose the Wisbeach incinerator. The consultation window during COVID has raised concern about the process and how it was communicated to residents and the ease in which it was to engage, given the above comments that I have made. Many arguing it impacted their right to be heard and the fairness of the decision we now have. An issue, no doubt, in the minds of those currently advising. This moment today is not for party politics. It's today to show our communities that this council has an in, as an interested party will do everything in its power to support them. We have the opportunity to support other local councils in a possible judicial review as a last resort, and if felt appropriate by the independent legal advice that they are obtaining. This is not a legal path that should be entered into lightly. The costs will be significant, but what cost to residents' health? The process could take many months or longer, but this is a fight we must be prepared to make for the health of our children. It would be the largest incinerator in the country and one of the largest in Europe, burning half a million tonnes of household waste each year. It's two chimneys higher than that of Ely Cathedral. We must be
be ready for a call from Fenland District Council, should it come, to support any legal costs and other local councils if the time comes. We have to make a decision today, as the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero considers that the date of publication for the purposes of Section 118 of the Planning Act 2008 is the 20th of February 2024, meaning a six-week deadline for a judicial review is days away and the Easter Bank holidays a complicating factor. Even then, the fight is not over. The Environment Agency still hasn't given a permit to operate, although a decision is expected imminently. Finally, recycling is the key to reducing the hungry monster needs to remain financially viable. Recycle, reuse and reduce is not just a slogan, and if we increase our recycling rates sufficient, sufficiently, there'll be little alternative methods for waste disposable. We are already told that incinerators in the east of England operate below capacity, so let's try and do them out of a job. It's the responsibility of every council, every business, and each and every one of us in our own individual ways to reduce the amount of resident, re residual waste we generate. We must keep fighting this monster. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have a secondary in Councillor Kemp? Councillor Kemp, would you like to speak now or reserve your right? Um, I'd like to speak now, please, Chair. Thank you very much. Yes, ten, ten years ago, I was elected to fight the Southland incinerator, which the community did. And we now find that on the West Norfolk border, um, a company wants to build an, another incinerator, which would be over twice as large. And we now know much more than we, we do then about the effects of these things. We also know from the National Infrastructure Commission that the UK could save £6.2 billion by 2050 if it increases recycling rates and doesn't build new incinerators. The government must do more to boost and encourage the circular economy and increase recycling. And it is true to say that the National Infrastructure Commissioner says there shouldn't be new incinerators that don't involve carbon capture, and this one doesn't. There's every reason to turn it down. There is also the health issue as well, and the all-parliamentary group on air pollution looked at a lot of research and found risks to children's health and also risks to farm produce. The FENS is a huge area of fertile agricultural land. In fact, it has half of the most agriculturally fertile land in the whole of the country. And this incinerator could put it at risk. There have been studies which have shown that incinerator material can be found embedded in eggs on farms. 10, within 10 kilometers of an incinerator. They have found that dioxins from incinerators can be found embedded in children's toenails and related to childhood leukemia. This is something we cannot allow to happen. There is an overcapacity of incinerators in the East, as we've already heard. In fact, this was one of the reasons why this chamber voted in principle against the incinerator in May 2022. It's a breach of the proximity principle. It would be allowed to bring um, waste on, on roads from up to two hours away, which would bring waste perhaps from areas like London to the, the, the areas of like the Fens and West Norfolk. This cannot be allowed to happen. We have to realise that we can do a lot to stop this. There's been letter writing campaigns. I and other councillors in this chamber have been to speak against the facility at the planning inquiry. We know that we must do all we can as a, as a host authority, a fellow host authority, to support Fenland in its hour of need. We know what the, the southwesterly winds from Wispeach across the very flat area of the Fens to West Norfolk to Kings Lynn to areas like Clinch Wharton and South Lynn can do. We know that you don't build a 90 metre high set of chimneys for, for no reason at all. It's because the emissions cannot all be captured. Gaseous emissions cannot be captured. And there's more and more recent research. Um, Professor Vian Howard found that even though incinerator filters can stop small particulates, they allow ultrafine particulates into the local environment, which at scale constitute a significant health hazard. We, we know that the, the, the issue of the dioxins in chicken eggs up to 10, meters, 10 kilometers away could put our farming areas at risk. What about considerations for our, our agricultural industry? This is, was Thank not you, taken Councilor into Kemp, account. Thank you. So I would ask everybody to support this, this motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I um, will now open that up for debate. Councillor Long. Yes, thank you, Chairman. I, like uh, Councillor Kemp, did proactively try and stop the incinerator in West Norfolk, and I was supportive of the votes that were taken to oppose the incinerator in, just over the border in Cambridgeshire. 
However, nothing I've heard from the proposer or the seconder um, indicates why. My understanding is that Fenland District Council, as the appropriate local authority, are exploring exactly that. And if they have reason within the advice that they obtain to launch a judicial review, it doesn't automatically overturn the permission that's been given. This, unfortunately, has been a decision that's taken. If the process is found to be flawed, it doesn't mean that the decision will change. It potentially could mean that it's changed, but I, I find it difficult to uh, support committing this council and the people of Norfolk to uh, 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 an open-ended legal cost and on that basis, I'm afraid, I can't support the motion, but I'm thoroughly behind what the people of West Norfolk said when they were given the, uh, 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 a poll and they said they didn't want incineration and they didn't get the incinerator that we, were talk that we talked about previously. Unfortunately, this one has permission and if there is a legal challenge to be made, I support Finland and Cambridge here in their actions. It's, in the it's on their patch, but I can't commit the people of Norfolk to an open-ended cost. Thank you. Councillor Vardy. Yes, thank you. And uh, adding to what uh, uh, Councillor Long has just said, you will all be aware that this council wrote uh, in strongest terms its objection to the, uh, this um, uh, development. And I think that um, that was met. Uh, by, well, we know the outcome was that it was, uh, our thoughts were ignored in a sense. Uh, by, by, the plan, by the planning authority. If we're approached by another authority uh, to um, take part in any judicial proceedings, then, of course, we will take appropriate advice uh, to how, how we might or might not uh, proceed with that. But uh, that's something until we know that, until we're approached... Um, certainly, it won't be something I would think that this council will be initiating, uh, but we will be there to respond to any requests, taking um, our legal advice and appropriateness on board. So, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Roper. <coughs> Excuse me, Councillor Roper. Thank you. I'm a little bit confused by the, the two speeches I've just heard because Councillor Long talks about a blank cheque. There's nothing about a blank check in this motion. There's, there's nothing about an open-ended commitment within this motion. What the final paragraph of this motion says will ask Cabinet to consider what support we can provide in any future judicial review. That could be money. That could be assistance of other kinds, um, the, the expertise of our officers and our members. Support can have a wide range of meanings. And it's completely twisting things out of proportion to say that this is a blank check and an open-ended financial commitment. And, and I, I think that's a, a disappointing um, uh, way to look at this motion. I'm interested by what Councillor Vardy says about if we are ap approached, we will seek uh, appropriate legal advice on, on what the Cabinet does. Absolutely. There is nothing within this motion that prevents that from happening. In fact, my concern is actually, if you vote this motion down today, you might actually tie the council's hands on being able to take that advice and that balanced view if um, such um, a, an approach is made. Uh, I think this is a very measured motion. It reaffirms the council's position and it leaves things open as to how we might support communities and campaigners in the future. It doesn't tie hands, it's not a blank check, it's not an open-ended commitment. So I would urge people not to twist the motion, to vote on the words which are in front of you, uh, and to support this today. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Councillor Price. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I'd uh, reiterate the words of Councillor Roper there. I, it, it does seem that... Uh, there's a lack of understanding of the wording here, but I think that's been cleared up for members before deciding to vote. There is 
no financial commitment here. It's interesting, we, ha we had the Generation Park incinerator proposed to be built in Norwich uh, in my ward a few years back. And so I, you know, I was fortunate enough to have a number of residents with technical skills uh, and knowledge of such areas. And I, I was staggered, I was staggered to, to find out about the uh, spreading of particulates that such incinerators do. Now, as, as a county, we have a duty of care for people's health. We've heard about the potential impacts on that rich farming land uh, and the agriculture that we have here. Uh, and let's be clear, these particulates, the, the air quality is an essential and an important thing. Air quality is not good enough in Norwich, where, where I live and in parts of my, in my ward because of car fumes. And perhaps electric cars will help deal with that the, the real process is to, to remove those dirty cars from the road. But going back to the incinerator, you've got a duty of care to protect young children. Um, these particulates, they pass through the blood, they pass into the brain, and, um, and, they, and they affect the health, particularly of young people. Um, this, the, the prevailing wind is going to send these particulates into Norfolk. We, we have a duty of care. The motion very clearly asks us to consider how we can support. We've already said that we are you know, against the actual application. So in terms of good cross-party working, as, as it's been suggested, and, and to show a united council, and it's now clear there is no financial commitments, what other excuse do you have not to support the motion today? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Councillor Jeremy. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I doubt I have very much in common politically with Steve Barclay, MP, or uh, the leader of Fenden Council, but I absolutely support their opposition to this incinerator. Um, and I actually went and read the motion that went before Fenland uh, Council, which was adopted, and it's actually a really good motion. It's quite detailed, and I would urge members to have a look. There are obvious impacts on air quality, health, and congestion. But one of the primary objections for me to incineration generally, and this incinerator is no different, different, they burn much of what could be otherwise recyclable material. And there's been lots of examples where recycling rates have decreased in areas where there are incinerators to provide the fuel necessary to burn. Incinerator companies are marketing waste to energy as a source of renewable energy, which is quite uh, amusing because unlike other renewables, the fuel does not come, um, does not come from uh, infinite natural processes. On the contrary, it's a source from finite resources. I hope that full council adopts this motion. It seems as if we won't, but it is something that matters to Norfolk residents and our cabinet should be looking to support others uh, and uh, to, to help combat this proposal. If there were an incinerator proposal like this on the edge of Norfolk, I think we would be looking to Cambridgeshire and if it was in the south to Suffolk, uh, to support us, and I think it's right that we should be supporting them. I have no other questions at this stage. In that case, we will ask Councillor Colwell to uh, sum up. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chair. I want this Council to realise that all Councillor Kemp and I are asking in this motion is for Cabinet to consider what <clears throat> support they can provide. And if, they are, if we are, as a council, are not allowing our Cabinet to do that, to me, that raises questions about whether or not we, as a council, are doing everything for the, our communities and our residents. And the reason why, you can't just simply say, this is an incinerator in Cambridgeshire. Let's look at the situation of this. We are talking hundreds of metres from the Norfolk border. And it would be crazy to think that the emissions and particulates that are, could potentially harm our residents will not go over the border. Um, we owe a duty to our residents. We've heard today Councillor, Councillor Roper on commenting on the, the, the comments from Councillor Roper suggested that it was trying to be twisted. He refers to a blank cheque. Well, there's no comment in there. Councillor Price reiterated that we're not demanding financial assistance. We're asking for our cabinet, the people that have been entrusted by the residents of Norfolk to do what is best for us, to look at this. Councillor Jeremy, thank you for the support. 
I would ask you think, to think very carefully because you will be sending a message with your vote to the residents of West Norfolk. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will now move to the vote. Alex, if you can prepare the vote, please. Okay, that looks as though the voting is finished. Has everyone voted who wishes to do so? Thank you very much. In that case, the result is 4, 21, against 32, abstentions 2. So the motion is lost. Thank you very much. We now move on to motion 3, which is a Labour Group motion uh, proposed by Councillor Brochek Colton. This has been the fourth time that we try to give carers in Norfolk a voice, so here's hoping we'll receive the support from everyone and help carers to have less stress when they're trying to do their job around Norfolk for our residents who need our care. I have over four months of backing and forthing been given permit information from some of the highways officers, even though I've been told that working on how much it would cost for permits to be put through for Norfolk is something that is not necessarily for me to know. One of the Conservatives, MP, MPs, Damien Moore, did in 2023 praise free car parking schemes and encourage local authorities who are not already undertaking similar projects to look and learn from those areas that have been implemented their own parking schemes. Remember, Devon did this, and not just in COVID times, which is what we've been told, but um, also um, um, this was done um, several years before COVID as well. I would also like to ask that the Parking Partnerships website be looked at as it's extremely difficult to find business permits that I've been told would be great for carers. Having it under the section of hotel, guest house and B&B &B daily permits, how would you know that this is where you need to go to find your permit? And I would also ask why is it taking four months for the officers to tell me that? Instead of refusing this motion and not giving us a chance to have it looked into, please consider recognising that to consider introducing a scheme for Norfolk that requires full scoping of demand through engagement with carers and care providers, as well as consideration of any financial implications. And of course, ask the Cabinet Member for Highways, Transport and Infrastructure to develop proposals for a Norfolk parking scheme for care workers for consideration by Cabinet via the Infrastructure and Development Select Committee. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, you have a seconder, Colleen Walker. Councillor Walker, would you like to speak now or reserve your right? Yes, I'll second the motion and speak now, if I may. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, as my colleague has already pointed out, we must try to prevent the fines levied against our carers who work tirelessly to give help and assistance to our most vulnerable and those in the most need. And there's plenty of them among us, believe you me. I think I'm getting to that stage myself. So I, do, I would suggest that we, we look at this quite seriously. Um, what we are actually saying here is that they're losing very much precious time that can be spent with the client. If you're driving around looking for a parking space and you've only been a lot at eight minutes with, with your client, it doesn't sit very well if you've got to walk any distance after finding somewhere to park to actually get in and, and work with your client. It's not good, it's not fair. The time allocated to carers to give the assistance to the client and enable them to, to get on with the rest of their day. However, we have a major recruitment issue also with carers and parking fines do not encourage people to apply to work in this field. Therefore, I would respectfully ask for your support and our plea for car parking permits for carers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, we'll now open that up to debate. Councillor Plant. 
Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> Uh, this matter has been discussed on several occasions with the councillor. Um, since this matter has been raised, Norfolk County Council have consistently explained that there are existing arrangements in place within the current Norfolk Parking Partnership Agreements to purchase permits to park within residence parking zones. And there are currently only three areas in Norfolk which operate RP, uh, resident parking zones, Norwich, Great Yarmouth and Kings Lynn. Existing schemes have been in place for many years in these three areas to enable either carers to purchase their own permits or residents to purchase visitors' permits for their carers. As with residents' permits, these permits can only be used in the designated permit parking zones within these three areas. They do not allow parking on other restrictions, e.g. double yellow lines. The majority of permits are now virtual, not physical, and are purchased online, although they can be purchased via a phone call to the relevant authority. Um, and this is also the same in Norwich. There is a, another element of this, I asked adult social care as well, uh, because obviously they uh, get the services of, adults, of carers through adult social care. And parking permits are made available via an arrangement Norfolk County Council has with Norwich City Council to domiciliary care agencies commissioned by Norfolk County Council operating in the city. This system works effectively and I'm not aware of any issues arising. Staff are advised that they have responsibility to park in accordance with local restrictions. Permits are for use when an NCC business on NCC business only, and that permit display does not grant an exemption to park anywhere. Carers are generally personally liable for non-compliance. And to, no, to their knowledge, we've not been approached to broker arrangements with other districts where on-street parking is considerably less regulated than the city. DCA's initial assessment of clients should have should include the availability, proximity of parking of the carer as a driver, in practice more challenging parking, etc. And he says, in, I'm aware of only one carer in five years, and I'm sure this is the carer that Councillor uh, Brookencheck, I have to apologise, uh, is, is dealing with, um, in five years, approached my team directly to support a penalty charge notice appeal. In that case, it was evident that, A, they had parked contrary to the restrictions in force, and B, there were several lawful alternatives available very nearby. And C, there were no extenuating circumstances. Their employer had refused to support the appeal, and I similarly could not find grounds to do so. Um, and while it is frustrating not to secure a parking space in front of the house visited, this isn't a reported issue for 99% of carers' DCAs we commission. So from the information that I've been given, there isn't a call for it. There's never been a call for it in the last five years that we know of from the adult social care services. And then there's another issue of, are carers just those employed by the carer authorities, or are we talking about carers who look after somebody, just the I'm carer? Jeff. Thank you, Councillor Plant. And so I can't support this. Thank you um, very much. Chairman. Councillor Watkins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Lib Dem group fully support this Labour motion. The idea of carers parking permits is an excellent one, which I hope is shared widely across the Council. We all recognise the dedicated and selfless role that carers play in our lives, looking after our friends and loved ones, often in very difficult circumstances. We undoubtedly owe them a debt of gratitude, but not enough is being done to provide them with the support that they so deserve. As the motion makes clear, our care staff are not highly paid and are having to spend time finding a suitable place, parking place on certain visits adds to the stress and anxiety that they often have to experience. We are still living in an ongoing cost of living crisis despite some more welcome economic news and many carers, along with others in low paid professions, often struggle to make ends meet it seems unacceptable that they face a risk of a parking fine in trying to fulfil a much-needed service. There is clearly an anomaly here if other service professions have been treated more equitably. Um, Councillor Plant says existing arrangements clearly, uh, clearly go far enough. Well, I think uh, many of us on this side of the chamber would take issue with that. Um, they do appear to be inadequate, or else there would not be the need for this motion being brought forward. So I take issue that um, this is not a, not a problem for carers. 
There needs to be a fair and workable solution to this issue. It should be relatively cost-effective to do so, as we've heard from the mover, and I think it is something that would clearly send out the right message. The motion refers to a growing number of examples around the country where a parking permit for carers scheme has been introduced and is working effectively. So it is becoming increasingly widespread. So I therefore support the recommendation, the Labour recommendation, the motion, that we should look to introduce something similar here in Norfolk, and I hope that the idea can be progressed over the coming months. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have no further questions. Sorry, Councillor Thomas, my apologies. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm sure that no one within this council chamber would do anything but give their appreciation and applause for the hard work of carers across Norfolk who provide much needed help and support to those in greatest need. Um, when this issue came to the, the fore some months ago, um, obviously I discussed this with the Executive Director for Adult Social Care, um, and this was not an issue that had been relay, ra raised to us um, in any kind of prolific number. There had been the one instance that is quoted brought to our attention, and as a consequence I had advice from the team that the responsibility for providing a parking permit to a carer is their employer. It is not the responsibility of the County Council. Uh, many of the care organisations provide parking permits to their employees, um, and that is the right course for people who are working in the care industry to go back to their employer, and if they are having trouble fulfilling the, the care needs for the people that they're supposed to be visiting because they're struggling to park, then it is the duty of their employer to provide them with a permit. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I wasn't going to mention speak, but um, I, just to summarise uh, uh, Councillor Thomas then, um, she's begun by saying that <clears throat> we should applaud carers. So would it be fair to summarise the Conservatives' view on this as clap for carers? Thank you. No. <laughs> uh, right. Um, I now have no further questions. We will therefore ask uh, Councillor Rojek Colton to sum up, please. Yeah, I'll be really quick. I'm really appreciative that we finally got our motion in this week, at uh, this time. Um, and um, I, I don't mean to disagree with um, Councillor Thomas, but I have, uh, by the different people who are employed by the different agencies that getting the permit is not as easy as saying. If you go onto our website in the piece where you're supposed to be able to easily be able to get a permit, trying to find it is like looking for gold dust. So maybe that needs to be changed. Um, I want to thank all of you who will vote for this tonight. It's disappointing if we don't get this through, but it's not unexpected. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll now move to the vote. Alex, please, if you could uh, prepare the vote. I think that looks as though everyone has voted who wishes to. So the result is 421 against 33 abstentions, none. So that motion is lost. We now move on to item four, which is the motion from the Green Group. And I call upon Councillor Osborne to propose that motion. Thank you. I feel quite privileged, actually, because this is the first time we've, had a, we've been able to speak on a motion since I think the Constitution changed to, to put us in fourth place. Um, uh, when the Chancellor announced last year in the budget that there was going to be an expansion in free childcare to cover two-year-olds, I thought, you know, initially I thought that that was a good thing. Obviously, I've got a personal interest in that because my little one turns two in July, so I would benefit from that. Um, but actually... On looking into the news and going to speak to childcare providers, we realised that actually it's 
it's uh, been quite disastrous for a lot of a lot of those providers. Um, sorry, I'm just just making sure that people because uh, it seemed like there was some commotion. Yeah, I'll carry on. Um, uh, because in fact, the the free childcare that's being provided is not free at all. Uh, the funding that's being given to childcare providers for that 15 hours a week for two-year-olds is not sufficient. It means that uh, they will that they will either have to charge for nappies for for food or charge additional costs on top of the the, um, the free hours, which is what's happening at the nursery that my little one's in right now. Uh, on top of that, there's been a, an ongoing, sorry, Councillor Borrett, would you mind talking a bit quieter? I understand that you might need to talk, but I, it's quite distracting. <laughs> Councillor Borrett? Thank you. Hello? How rude. How rude. Councillor Borrett? Excuse me, Chair. It is really can distracting. I can hear it from back here um, hear over the rude. microphone. Thank you. No, I do apologise. Uh, no, but you're talking quite loudly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, carry on, Councillor Osborne. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, as I was saying, on top of the, the financial difficulty, a lot of childcare providers are facing a severe staffing shortage. Um, they can get, because of the low pay, they can be get better pay um, for less hours and less stress stacking shelves in, in ASDA. And according to some of the people I've spoken to. Um, so there's actually been a uh, struggle to recruit and to retain um, people who are really crucial workers for uh, ch children's early development, um, not to mention the fact that it, it frees parents up to, to go to work and, and to the other things that they, that they need to do in their lives. Uh, Councillor Webb will talk a bit more about the, the um, effect on disadvantaged children, which I have to say I wasn't, uh, on disabled children, sorry, which I have to say I wasn't aware of until looking into this more closely. Um, I think that this is an issue that actually isn't talked about enough. Uh, when the Chancellor announced um, further expansion in the in childcare in budget this year, he still failed to, to address the five billion pound shortfall in uh, funding for childcare. So, there needs to be some political action on this. Um, I, th I would hope that all councillors here would support this because uh, childcare is absolutely crucial for children's linguistic, cognitive, emotional, uh, social development, as well as the effect that Im impact that it has on, on uh, the Norfolk economy. And frankly, people who work in nurseries and people who work as childminders and work in ch childcare provision settings um, deserve to be fairly paid, they deserve to be um, have career progression options. They deserve to have, um, uh, be able to stay in their jobs because they can afford it, um, and they deserve to have decent conditions. So I hope that all councillors will support it. Thank you very much. Uh, you have a second for your proposal, Councillor Webb. Would you like to speak now? I'll reserve your right. Um, if I reserve my right, will I still have time? Because I know we're coming to the end. Can I, will I still be given time at the end to speak? Is that possible to just get agreement to? Um, the answer is probably not. Oh. So you, you may I'll speak now if you wish. There we go. I'll speak now then. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I'm going to focus on um, disabled children and the lack of provision that exists for childcare for, um, for those children, young people. And um, it's important to bear in mind that it's not just about early years. Um, as important as that is, which is, is also completely um, inadequate. Um, childcare for disabled children runs on for a lot longer um, because they need support outside of, uh, you know, for, mu for much longer. So a young person who may be age 13 can, be, can stay at home. For a disabled child, that's not the case um, necessarily. And, Every year, the figures are going down on this. So this year, the, the reports, I think I, in, the, in the motion, it says 18% of local authorities are reporting um, not enough provision for disabled children. This year's report, which has just came out last week, is it's down to 6%. Um, now, that's 6% that's, that's of local authorities the, nationally, so I'm not picking on Norfolk here, um, that don't have adequate provision for disabled children um, for childcare. Now that's affecting um, early intervention, 
we know how important early intervention is and the life chances um, increase with the more needs are met earlier on. We're stopping um, parents being able to go to work and their own careers and the, the opportunities that brings, the economy and, and mental health, all of those factors and um, the number of families that I speak to who, who just have to give up work. Um, and I'm going to just read out one comment from a, a parent who, um, my daughter has lost her wraparound care place this week as they can no longer cope with her behaviour. If they could get additional support or funding, they could maintain it, but there's no help for them, so she has to stop going, which likely means I'll have to work less hours, but more importantly, she will lose out on something that she absolutely loves. There's no other provision locally to us when, with childcare who can manage children with additional needs, and it's heartbreaking. You know, what we're asking is for the, for the council to look into this, for it to um, investigate further the amount of provision that it has, um, and, and this, you know, we should be able to do that. We should want to do that. We should want to make it right for, um, for families and for children across the board, and particularly for disadvantaged um, children disadvantaged by various disabilities. And, you know, it's not too much to expect us to want to do that. So I hope you'll support the motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, Councillor smith Clare. I believe you have an amendment you would like yeah, to Yeah, thank you, Chair. We had given notice to propose and move this amendment, so hopefully we'll have time to do that. Um, the amendment was accepted, wasn't it? Yeah, the amendment has been accepted, which yep. is fantastic. So on that one, I would like to make a statement on that in support of that. And that is backing up what the Greens have already put across. The serious underfunding to early years provision is quite frankly disgraceful, resulting in the closure of nurseries and childcare providers. The underfunding has been constant and damaging, not just on essential provision, but on those young people and their families accessing them. It appears that the sector isn't just underfunded, but embarrassingly overlooked and neglected. A case of huge demand and woefully sparse supply. Norfolk's children, particularly SEND youngsters, deserve better. This motion and our amendment promotes the importance of this sector, its beneficiaries and its future. I therefore urge it to be accepted. Thank you very much. Um, do you have a second for your uh, amendment, Councillor Morphew? Would you like to speak now? or if we... <laughs> There won't be time to reserve. Um, <laughs> the amendment identifies the importance of childcare to the economy of the county, as well as all of the other uh, elements that have been mentioned. So what the uh, amendment does is to say that um, it's important to the workforce, to the economy, and to people trying to get to work, the parents, um, that we do actually address childcare. So we should be looking at it as an economic driver as well as a social good. We do have the opportunity through the county deal for Norfolk to invest in the economy and we're suggesting that part of that money should be applied to childcare in order to boost the economy and those working in it. Thank you very much. Excuse me. The... That amendment has been accepted, so that now becomes a substantive motion, so it's now open for debate. Councillor, Councillor um, Price. Price. Price, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Chair. I'll be quick. We've got two minutes. That's why I checked at the beginning. But, uh, yeah, I, I look over at the, the uh, blue benches, and I guess a lot of the uh, councillors don't have young children at the moment. I do. Jamie does. It's really tricky. It's really tricky to be able to go out, earn your money, look after your kids, um, support through that process. I'd like to point out to the blue benches, okay, that we are reaching a point where we are not replenishing the population. We had a baby boom, okay? We are now hitting a baby bust. We are not going to have workers to look after the elderly. All of the statistics are pointing to this. Where you have a government that makes it harder and harder for people to work and have a family and children, okay, you are not replenishing the next generation of workers and taxpayers. It's a very simple investment, investing in the youth and, and in people having children and having families because the costs down the road at the end of this century are going to be exceptional. And just the irony of the fact that people voted to leave 
uh, Brexit and are so concerned about immigration that at the end of this century, we will be begging people to come here over other westernized countries to replenish our lost workforce. I wish you would be around to see that. But anyway, let's, ins let's help young people and young families get on and continue to replenish the workers of tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right, members, the three hours has elapsed and the meeting has not been extended. As a result, and in line with rule four, brackets five, we will now cease all debate on the matter currently under debate and move to the vote. I think that looks as though it's uh, finished. Has everyone voted who wishes to do so? In that case, the results are 421 against 33, abstentions zero. So that motion is lost. We now move on to motion five, which is the... Uh, Chairman, could I withdraw the motion, please? Yes, of course you may before I even had a chance to say it. Well done. Sorry. <laughs> Speed reading. I'll let you off. Right, so that's, that's withdrawn. Uh, motion six, the Labour Group motion. Do you wish to withdraw it? Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Motion seven, the Lib Dem Group motion. Uh, Councillor Watkins, do you wish to withdraw that? I would like that? to withdraw that motion, Mr Chairman. Thank you, thank Lib. You. Motion eight. Uh, Councillor Walker, do you wish to withdraw that? Thank you. Motion nine, the Labour Group motion. Councillor Morphew. No, we'd like that one to go to the vote, please, Chair. Right, can we we'll take that one to the vote? We're just waiting for that one to clear and then uh, we'll get the next vote up. Okay, looks like we're getting that vote now. Yeah, that's not the right one. It's got uh, the malnutrition one, and actually, it's item eight. Thank you. If you just take this back and we'll review later. <coughs> just mention to the members, we'll take it back and review later. There's just some confusion about which motion we were. Yeah, we're just reloading. Yeah, uh, we're just reloading the uh, the correct order of motions. We got it. Uh, that's it, Western Link. That's now the correct um, motion, so we can vote on that. I think that's probably the end of that vote. Mm -hmm. So the results are 420 against 35, abstentions zero. So that motion is lost.
Okay, now move on to item 18, which was um, under rule 9.3 to receive any questions. We did have a question from Councillor Kemp, and the Cabinet Member for Highways, Infrastructure and Transport has supplied a written response to Councillor Kemp, which has been dis distributed to members. You should all have a copy of that. So we'll now move on to item 19, appointments to committees and subcommittees. There are no new appointments to note. So that, therefore, this meeting is now closed. Thank you very much for your attendance and your kind attention.